The reason why it failed was not because it was too ambitious. It failed because the alignment between that and the AU's own strategic plans was not always. watching the AAE TV newsroom live this morning and we are coming to you from the headquarters of the Association of African Universities here in Accra, Ghana and my name is Lydia Nyame and joining me in the studio this morning are Jumai Madaladam Doche and my name is Ajiman Otrodako and the headlines for this morning on higher education African University is set to deepen collaborations a part while emphasizing the just ended African Universities Week celebration. And in our health news, latest COVID-19 vaccine continue to evolve as more proof for long-lasting immunity emerges. And in addition, total number of COVID-19 cases passes 52.8 million. In our science and technology news update, Apple's new custom-built M1 processor chip poses a great threat to the PC market, especially to Intel and other PC markets. The demand for higher education in Africa has increased as universities across the continent participate in the global knowledge economy and have partnerships across the world. Now, this power the celebration of the African Universities Week on the theme, Digital Transformation in African Higher and Tertiary Education Amidst a Global Health Pandemic, as African universities reaffirm their effort to collaborate in research, teaching and learning as well as scholarships. The African Universities Week is celebrated annually by universities in Africa to commemorate the birth of AU on the 12th of November 1967 in Rabat, Morocco. The week's celebration brings together higher education stakeholders across Africa to discuss contemporary issues pertinent to the improvement of the quality and the relevance of higher education to the development of the African continent. This event has become a premier one on the calendar of AU and has been celebrated by higher education institutions since the year 2000. Now, let us start off by reflecting on the key account of this year's African Universities Week and day one of the week celebration focused on digital transformation in African higher and tertiary education, a holistic and sustainable approach. But Ajamana, I want to know how, how well have we been able to utilize digitization in African higher education? Well, uh, let me start by saying that this year's African University celebration was awesome, great organization. Extremely amazing. And I'm glad about that. the formation that I mean, it's the first time you know, from COVID actually caused us not to uh, have this event face-to-face, exactly. -face, but having yeah. it online and having this great um, routine. Exactly. I mean, it says a lot uh, to, to AAU and I'm saying exactly. kudos to the organizers for such a great, uh, the, the storyline over there. It's just amazing that amazing. everyone is inclusive. Yeah. We're all in this together. Yeah. But now back to the main issue, that mm -hmm. is the digital transformation and how holistic and sustainable it is for development. Okay. It's about time that we migrated from the manual traditional way of doing this exactly. to the digital platform. Exactly. Because we've realized that that is what the investors overseas are doing. Mm -hmm. And they are making waves. They are being productive. They are being effective and efficient. Exactly. So it's about time we also make time, invest in this technological infrastructure, and also reap the benefits of this effectiveness and efficiency. Exactly. So we can also grow. Mm -hmm. So about time, if we want to sustain our growth holistically, 
that we must go take it all. Mm -hmm. That's, really good. That's true. Thank you very much. And uh, now moving to day two of the week's celebration. And it also had a theme, reshaping women leadership in a transforming and digitized world. And of course, it is important to reshape women. But Jemima, I, I want to know, is, is it important, is it necessary to reshape women in a time like this? Yeah, it is very important because, first of all, um, when you take the SDG Goal 5, okay. which talks about gender equality, where everyone, male or female, is given an equal opportunity to take up roles to help in national development. Mm -hmm. And also looking at the women empowerment, which is key to the UN, where women are given um, the platform, mm -hmm. the opportunity to take up um, Leadership positions. leadership positions to help in national development. So at the long way around, women are given the opportunity, the, the stance, the, um, the way uh -huh. to bring out what What's they, the leadership in them. Exactly. So I think it's a good step. It's very important. Th that's very tragic, man. Yeah, you know, if you thought um, we were still going back to the old way of doing things where women were being relegated to mm -hmm. some very menial roles, well, yeah. then you better wake up because it's the, the game has changed where exactly. women are now stepping up for themselves, the power from within exactly. that was quite hidden is now being shown. Yeah, that's true. Now women are stepping up to leadership positions, and they are doing very well. Exactly. So we we just want to eschew that thought of um, closing the gap on women and now opening women up for so many positions. And you know what? It will interest you to know that currently mm -hmm. the president elect, vice president elect vice president. for the United States of America, yeah. as Senator Kamala Harris. Exactly. And, oh and it tells us that yes the women can break the barriers exactly yeah. and step up and chat the path for other women to also believe in themselves that now no one can just relegate you to exactly. any other yeah. mineral you can step up and then Personal. take the bull by the horn yeah. and then make this happen exactly so women can step up and do whatever it is that you see yourself doing and we're moving to day three of the week celebration and it also ushered in new members who wish to join the AAU. Day four of the celebration also worked on the theme research, general establishment and maintenance and most of it all had an address by the U AAU, sorry, AAU president and now let's quickly take the address. To the guests from industry and other sectors, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. On the behalf of the governing board of the Association of African Universities, and the entire membership of AU, I take this opportunity to welcome you all from across the length and breadth of the African continent and beyond to this very important event on the calendars African Higher Education, the celebration of African Universities Week. I would like to express our special appreciation to you all for having found a slot in your heavy schedules to attend this ceremony, which is a testimony of your usual commitment to AAU and higher education in general. The African Universities Week is celebrated annually by universities in Africa to commemorate the birth of AAU on the 12th of November, 1967 in Rabat, Morocco. The week of celebration brings together higher education stakeholders across Africa to discuss contemporary issues pertinent to the improvement of the quality and the relevance of higher education to the development of the African continent. This event has become a premier one on the calendar of AU and has been celebrated by higher education institutions since the year 2000. Among the Fifth and final day of the week celebration also focused on digital accessibility and open access for higher education institutions. Where are we? That's, 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 that's the biggest question here. Where do we find ourselves as African higher institutions in, in terms of this, Ajman? You know, I think uh, we've come a very long way when it comes to African higher education institutions and digitization. Mm -hmm. So I will start from digitization. If you are not digitized at this point, 
that you are not even part of open access. Exactly. Yeah. Because you need to be in a digital mode or present digital platform. Exactly. So you can also share information much faster. Exactly. Okay. Now, if you're also in a digital platform, then we must say, why are we not opening ourselves up to share information amongst each other? Exactly. Why are we not collaborating much better? Mm -hmm. Why are we not having much more partnerships? Mm -hmm. In Africa, right from the inception of the AAU, that was meant to be the apex higher education body in Africa, mm -hmm. to marry all other African higher education institutions together in terms of capacity building, mm -hmm. research development, uh, human resource uh, uh, capacitation, building all these things, these values and leveraging these values amongst them all together. Right from 1967, with 33 uh, members, yeah. up until now, we've seen a, a great progress, 400 investors and more, mm -hmm tells us that people are understanding the need exactly. to open up, they need to yeah. share, they need to leverage our competences no, but, but, each other. But you know, the question is, are we opening up in the first place? Well, you know, I would want to say that the unfortunate thing here is perhaps it's a competition. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a fight for supremacy. Exactly. I want to be the best investor in Africa, mm -hmm. regardless of what you're going through. And with that mentality or mindset, there wouldn't be any need for me to share with you. Exactly. Which we have to eschew that kind of mindset to be able to share information amongst each other that much to see us all grow together. And that is why the AAU is here doing this for the past 53 years. And they will still be doing it very well. Mm -hmm. um, Jamal, wh wh where do we find ourselves? I think I agree with Ajamine when he says we should open ourselves up to share information because what will it um, benefit you when you are pronounced the best university <laughs> in Ghana or Africa? <laughs> it actually, it, uh, like, they have actually get a lot from it. Exactly, but it, uh, you being there and your other universities being beneath you. I don't see any importance of that. So why wouldn't you just open up, share your information, share how you made it there so that other universities will follow suit? Because right now, let's say the University of Ghana is good in this profession mm -hmm. and Ken University is good in that. All of you have to come together exactly. because those who like um, Legon will not be the same people who like UG. Everybody mm -hmm. have diverse professions exactly. that they want to delve into. So I think every university should open up, share information, bring out their thoughts, their knowledge to help everyone so that we can all get up there. It's very important. I, exactly, but okay, I think you want to say something. You know, something. many, many investors in Africa are trying to internationalize their operations, you know, trying to make more collaboration with other universities in Europe, uh, across the African continent, beyond yeah. the African continent. Mm -hmm. And that is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But you know, before we could even go international, we need to build these standards exactly. out, out over here. Yeah. Investors like Stellenbosch University in South Africa mm -hmm. has quite a number of um, partnerships, collaborations beyond the African continent, mm -hmm. which builds on their competences. And I know there are other uh, partnerships within the continent as well. We have Arua, uh, the African Research Alliance. Mm -hmm. We also have the AAU and other inter university mm -hmm. partnerships in Africa. What we are saying is that we need to reaffirm our yeah. efforts to create more collaborations. Okay. The more we collaborate, the more we are able to understand or have a common ground, a valuable common ground in terms of teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. A much more resourceful common ground mm -hmm. with regards to research and development. Okay. A much yeah. more resourceful ground to build in our competences. And that's where we can see that the African continent is making headway okay. in terms of collaboration and partnership. Okay, but Ajima, having said that, I mean, what is preventing African universities from uh, embarking or, let me say, engaging in partnership and collaboration programs? You know, I think, I think uh, what, what we, um, Jemima earlier mentioned was, you know, that test for supremacy. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're being controlled here in terms of who's the best investor in Africa. Yeah with your resources. But the question is, who, who, who even, who, who ranks that in the first place? Because it's not, it, it doesn't come from Africans. Yeah, we, we've got yeah. Times Higher Education Rankings that's coming from the UK, uh, always ranking universities in Africa and telling who's the best research, who's the best exactly. um, output, innovation, technology. But when we rely on these rankings, perhaps we want to say, let's maintain our position. Mm -hmm. And if I want to maintain my position up there, it means I have to, com I have to compete. Exactly. And in competing, I have to now hoard my information, hoard my findings, hoard my data, and which will not, which actually also affect the good of others. Because if I have the best way or the best pedagogies in teaching and learning, why would I want to share with the university with me in Africa? 
to also know and also excel mm -hmm. and, and, and compete with me on the top. Mm -hmm. I'd say that wouldn't help. So maybe we have to eschew all these thoughts of supremacy and competition and see the common ground that we are African universities and we're all going together. Mm -hmm. we we're, we're serving the good of the African continent. Exactly. So we need to open up and create easy access amongst each other mm -hmm. so that we share information exactly. and, and grow together. Mm -hmm. I would say um, it starts from the scratch. You know, sometimes, let me go to our homes. Okay. When you're home, your parents will tell you, it's not like they're telling you not to share, but, you know, you sharing is a way of bringing you down or delaying you in a way. Because, mm -hmm. for instance, um, if I'm supposed to teach you something and I'm, I leave mine and I'm teaching you, that means I'm also lacking. Mm -hmm. So I think we can start um, opening up to our information right from the basis. Okay. That conception that you helping someone is actually delaying you should be cut off or should be erased in our African homes. I think that is where it will begin and okay. it will end well. But okay. again, let, me, let, me, let me chip in this quickly, okay? Mm -hmm. I think that beyond uh, the sentiments, let's look at the way forward. Of course. Has yeah. there been any technology or any digital platform that has all the information needed with regards to research, findings, data, raw data, mm -hmm. and suggestions that every investor can say, we have an African research platform that we can all log into and get information. Mm -hmm. Who is in charge of these data units and these institutions? Mm -hmm. How are they oriented? Mm -hmm. How are they also putting this together to ensure that this works? Exactly. Because the, the Saturday is that the, we, these people are the ones stepping on this floor. Mm -hmm. I mean, the university has a science and agreement to, to share information, but mm -hmm. the one of the data units is not sharing information yeah. or that is, doesn't leave behind proper um, systems mm -hmm. that makes it easy and accessible for someone to also share or disseminate. What is going to happen? <laughs> we go around in circles. Mm -hmm. So this must cascade down to all the units involved. Mm -hmm. They must be involved that listen, we are trying to share or open access to each other exactly. in Africa. And yeah. therefore, make sure you leave behind very clear information, clear information on how we can share appropriately mm -hmm. so we don't get phased up somewhere. Exactly. Thank you very much. And in our health news, also in a live social media chat, Dr. Anthony Fauci, Director of National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, announces that the first doses of a safe coronavirus vaccine are set to become available in December this year or early January 2021. This is, of course, if everything continues to go smoothly. Percent African Americans, more than 20 percent Latinx. Why does this matter? Why is diversity important for these trials? Well, Francis, that's a great question, and it is critically important uh, for the following reason. Uh, we hope and I believe we will get to the goal of showing that this vaccine is both safe and effective. We really do need to get everyone who is, could, could possibly benefit, particularly the most vulnerable in our population, ultimately to receive the vaccine when it is available. The only way we can with confidence look at our colleagues of the minority group, the Latinx, the African Americans, those that you mentioned, and say, this vaccine is safe and effective in you because we have proven by a clinical trial that it is. Whereas if they're not represented in the trial, there's always that lingering feeling that it was tested in a group that's not like them. Therefore, are we sure that it is going to work and be safe in them? We get them into the numbers that you just mentioned, which were quite good. You know, we pushed a lot to get there and we successfully did get there. So the answer to your question is it's critically important to have the diversity that you mentioned. What's the next step now that they've announced they've completed this, watching this more closely than anybody? Uh, what's the likely timetable uh, when there might actually be a vaccine available to the public if all goes well? Well, Francis, we never know absolutely for sure, but the projections that we have that I think and I hope will be reasonably accurate, that we will know sometime in December whether or not we have a safe and effective vaccine. And practically speaking, when will we, we be able to deploy that vaccine and get it to those individuals who need it the most, namely the prioritization that came from the ACIP and the National Academy of Medicine? 
I would think conservatively it would be sometime at the very end of December or the beginning of January. So that was Mr. Fauci saying if everything should go well, the first doses of COVID-19 vaccine will arrive in December and will be given to people to actually use it. So he also made a statement that um, he's hoping by the end of 2021, everything will turn to normal. Are there any signs to prove this? Well, you know, um, in the Fauci statement, I'll first of all say that he's one credible person, really followed the COVID uh, for quite a long time now. So I really take what he's saying. And if he says that um, if all things go so well, he will be um, someone who would take the vaccine, also recommend the others take the vaccine. So I think I believe that. But the most important thing right here is if everything goes very well, which he mentioned, he didn't really tell what exactly plays right. and everything goes very well. But yeah. I mean that what whatever he means about the past would be the trials, you exactly. know, trying the, the vaccine on the, 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 uh, the people that you mentioned, yeah. diverse people, the black people, uh, white, white people, people, Hispanics, the Asians, anyone that matters on this, mm -hmm. uh, on this face yeah. must be given the chance to try this vaccine exactly. for us to see how this vaccine transcends within them and how effective it is within them. So then we can be confident that it can be given an emergency authorization mm -hmm. out there for everyone to use it. So we're counting on that. Like if everything goes very well, then yeah. perhaps they say January 2021, everything will be okay. Exactly. I, I do agree with Ajaman. And I also think this is basically the best news we've, we've had uh, co uh, concerning getting a vaccine or a cure, what have you, on COVID-19. This is the best because it has, is it 90%? Yeah, 90%, 90 effectiveness. effectiveness. Yeah. And that, that's so awesome because we, we've heard of remdesivir and other... Pfizer. Exactly, but but this seems to be the best. So personally, for me, I'm hoping that, uh, like he said, everything would go on smoothly, and then hopefully in December 2020 or January 2021, it would be out. Okay, so by December 2021, it will be out. The coronavirus outbreak that began in Wuhan, China in December 2019, also known as SARS-CoV-2, has resulted in more than 52.8 million infections and nearly 1.3 million deaths worldwide. Surprisingly, COVID-19 has now been reported out in every continent except the Antarctica, with more reports from the Ariran News. Worldwide COVID-19 cases passed a grim milestone on Sunday with more than 50 million infections reported since the pandemic began. It only took 21 days for the global tally to pass 50 million after it exceeded the 40 million mark mid-October. In addition, according to the latest data from Johns Hopkins University, the global death tally topped 1.2 million just around 300 days after the virus first emerged from China. The record high number comes amid the second wave of COVID-19, which continues to strike the U.S. and Europe. The U.S., the country with the most confirmed cases and deaths in the world, hit almost 10 million cases and more than 230,000 deaths as of Sunday, according to the Johns Hopkins University tally. These record-breaking figures come after the country reported over 126,000 new cases the day before, marking the highest daily number since the outbreak of the pandemic. This was the fourth day that week for daily cases to surpass the 100,000 mark. Europe has also contributed to the rise in worldwide infections. According to Reuters, there have been nearly 12 million confirmed cases, and the continent accounts for 24 percent of total COVID-19 deaths worldwide. Over in France, deaths surpassed 40,000 as of Saturday, with a total of 1.7 million confirmed cases. The milestone comes after the country registered new daily records, with over 60,000 counted last Friday alone. Russia also hit their highest daily tally on the same day at over 20,000. Over in Italy, daily COVID-19 infections hit record high numbers on Saturday, with almost 40,000 new cases. Choi min Dong, Arirang News. Um, so we see um, a second uh, of COVID-19 blowing. Right now, their cases are increasing, and it's really surprising. What do you think is the cause? Because we actually thought it was coming down. But right now, it seems like it's another blow. Yeah, I find this um, second spike quite dramatic, and quite dramatic in terms like how, how are we seeing this happen? And what is happening in terms of the safety protocols that we're not following? 
But, you know, it was, it was mentioned, the Fauci mentioned that it's going to take a second spike, and a very heavy one, because we learned to grow with COVID and mm -hmm. learned to learn more about COVID whilst we, we, we knew it. You know, for past six months, when COVID came from Wuhan, China, we realized that it's, it's a very, very uh, disruptive virus that could last eight hours in the air that was also... Uh, much, much more, um, gives more strength when it gets in the mode of cold, it can spread faster. That's why I'm surprised that in the Antarctica, um, we're not finding some COVID cases over there because in the Antarctica, Nothing. that's quite a quite cold environment yeah. in the South Pole, and in that environment, there's no COVID. Don't you case. think it's surprising? Maybe so, nobody left to uh, Antarctica, perhaps. I, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think that's, that's unfortunate. So, these cases are just going because. Um, the symptomatic, asymptomatic cases are, are not predictable. These are very dynamic. And, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's very, very scary because, yeah. I mean, if someone has the virus and you can't, you can't be able to identify the person because the person doesn't have any symptoms, yeah, it's scary. It's, very it's really scary. scary. But, but, you know, personally, I also do think that the cases are escalating because we are not taking the precautionary measures seriously. Yeah. Some people don't think the virus is even real in the first place. So you go out and then you see only a few people wearing their nose mask. Yeah. Only a few people exercising the precautionary measures. So with this, definitely the cases would escalate. So with this, definitely the cases will escalate. Don't go anywhere as we bring you science and technology news after the short pause. Science and technology news on AETV News Live and... Tensions rise up in the tech market as Apple's custom-built M1 processor and the new MacBook Airs, MacBook Pros, and Mac Minis that are using it problem, uh, serve as a big problem for Intel. Now, the divorce proceedings, which seems a bit tough, will last about two years as the prestigious customer Apple gradually jets Intel's chips from their personal computers. Apple this week becoming the latest computer maker to introduce machines that don't use Intel-based chips. That means the makers of the two major operating systems, Windows and Mac, are both now manufacturing non-Intel computers. So could this up in the market? Well, John Ford is here to tell us. In on the other hand, and John, what are you thinking? Well, Becky, I'm not going to lie, this is up ending the PC market. If you're Intel, this is bad. I mean, you got AMD attacking you from the mainstream PCs under $1,000. Then you got Microsoft taking a little stab at the high end with an ARM chip in the Surface Pro X, but that was quiet. But now you've got Apple loud coming for your head. I mean, the claims Apple is making with the M1 chip in the MacBook Pro are insane. They're claiming up to 2.8 times the CPU speed versus Intel and up to 20 hours of battery life. Now, the problem here isn't just that Apple's going and doing its own ARM chip. It's that to compete with Apple, other PC makers are going to look at Intel alternatives, too. And that means Intel's either got to do major custom work or amp up chip performance so much that they blow Apple's claims out of the water. And all this is happening as Intel's having trouble manufacturing next generation chips anyway. Ouch. Intel's in trouble. So, John, it sounds like you don't see a lot of good options for Intel here. Well, uh, on the other hand, you can't just believe everything you see in these movie-length Apple commercials that they call launch events. I mean, you realize that's what these things are now with streaming. Anyway, Intel's not in that big of trouble yet. Apple says how much faster the M1 chip is compared with the old Intel Core i7 chips. Okay, but Intel's got an 8-core i9 now. Maybe compare it with that. Until we get real-world reviews and benchmarks, we won't know what these claims really are worth from Apple, but the battery life thing is impressive. Give Apple that. But also, for most people, the difference between 10 hours of battery life in a laptop and 20 is less significant than the difference between 5 hours and 10. So bottom line, yes, the pressure is on for Intel in the PC market like it never has been before. It's not just battling AMD, it's battling Qualcomm and NVIDIA and now Apple. But for Intel, this is a home game. They've made some mistakes, but they know this market. When Intel's new chips come out in 2021, those comparisons are going to look a lot more like a competitive PC market, not an upended one. But, John, if, if you're in a situation like Apple, why wouldn't you make your own chips if you can control it better, have it more directed, and, and go beyond? I, I guess the question becomes, can other 
companies do the same thing, or is that is it just Apple who's going to be able to really focus on these things and 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 do so many different things, be experts in lots of different things? Apple's in this unique position, Becky, because they make the Mac operating system themselves. They make so many different uh, components. They're very vertically integrated. Unlike, say, an HP, a Dell, a Lenovo, where they're getting the operating system from Microsoft, they're getting some chips from Intel or AMD, and they're kind of putting it together in their own custom way. So Apple can tune its stuff special. The, the downside, potentially, is if Apple doesn't do as great a job with those individual components as specialists like Intel. So not only is Apple trying to make its own CPUs now, it's also trying to make its own 5G chips. Can it do all that at once and craft its products? I mean, Apple's Apple, so maybe they can, but maybe they can't. Have it with our news report on science technology, and we saw how the M1 processor chip is going to turn this around. Apple goes again with their groundbreaking inventions, and th there we go. How do you find this? I mean, Intel used to produce these chips for Apple, um, five and all for the the motherboard, but now this all being brought together to one M1 chip, and that does the trend. How do you find it? I think this is a game changer a complete game changer and this is something that I believe hit Intel by surprise because for so many years they've been providing the Intel chips for them and all of a sudden Apple comes up with a much better one than the one that you're providing so this is it like it, it, it is a bigger 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 surprise to them and I also think it will cost them a lot because Apple happens to be their best yeah, uh, the biggest customer exactly so so losing such a customer it's, it's, it's huge. But you know, what, um, the issue about um, losing the big customer means losing the biggest revenue from Apple. Yeah. But what about competition now? Of course, Apple is not producing chips with Intel. <laughs> I think this, um, in a way of, um, I think, um, Intel coming up, I think they should do um, something for themselves because they are going to lose a lot. Yeah. And in a way of getting their, themselves back, their financial income back, I think they should also come up with a blow, exactly. yeah, which will help them get to the standards they were. So I think they should. You, you know, I also do think that they are not just losing Apple right now because if Apple is basically offering the best that Intel could ever offer, then Apple might end up, let me use might because you never know, yeah. might end up poaching other customers of Intel as well because everyone wants to get the best. Yeah. So, 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 hmm. yeah, there are lots of uh, competitors over there with mm -hmm. the likes of AMR, AMD, Qualcomm, and all these are chip producers. Exactly. Yeah. But now living Apple, uh, living um, Intel means giving Intel great competition right now because your biggest revenue is now This gone. is the biggest. It's now competing in the same market. <laughs> it's the, it's, the, it's the biggest the divorce in history. Intel should step up their game. Yeah, they should. Yeah. <laughs> Well, now that's all for the news. And in wrapping up, let us take a quick recap of our headlines. In higher education, African universities set to deepen collaboration, a path well emphasizing the just ended African Universities Week celebration. And in our health news, latest COVID 19 vaccine continues to evolve as more proof for long lasting immunity emerges. And in addition, total number of COVID 19 cases passes 52.8 million. And when it's science technology, Apple's new M1 processor chip poses a big threat to Intel and the PC market. And thank you very much for staying with AA TV News Live. My name is Lydia Nyame. And I am Jimai Madaladam Dache. My name is Ajamal Chudak. When I'm glad you spent time with us on the AA TV Newsroom Live. Spend more time with us and bring you more news and more programs. Have a nice day. The Association of African Universities, AAU, Africa's apex higher education organization, invites stakeholders to its 15th quadriennial general conference from 5th to the 8th of July 2021. 
The theme is the future of African higher education. The conference will be held virtually and hosted by the government of Ghana and the six sub-teams as follows. Sub-team 1. The future of African higher education post-COVID-19. Sub-team 2. Contributions of African higher education institutions to addressing the challenges linked to the COVID-19 pandemic. Sub-team 3. Contributions of African higher education institutions in achieving sustainable development goals. Sub-team 4. Funding of African higher education institutions in the face of unpredictable economy. Sub-team 5. Mainstreaming e-learning and the digital divide. Sub-team 6. Contributions of the diaspora to African higher education. Expert participants include ministries of higher education, academics, researchers and research organizations, regional economic communities, regional educational bodies like IUCEA, CAMES and SARUWA, the organized private sector and captains of industry, development partners and other education stakeholders. The AAU's 15 quadrennial general conference is here. To register, kindly go to the link below and for further inquiries, please visit the website www.event.aau.org slash GenCon or send an email to setgen at aau.org and copy info at aau.org. AAU, the voice of higher education in Africa. L'Association des Universités Africaines, AUA, l'Organisation Fertière de l'Enseignement Supérieur en Afrique, invite toutes les parties prenantes à sa 15e conférence générale quadrinale qui se tiendra du 5 au 8 juillet 2021. Le thème de cette conférence est l'avenir de l'enseignement supérieur africain. La conférence se tiendra victuellement et se sera accueillie par le gouvernement du Ghana. Elle comprend les six sous-thèmes principaux suivants. Sous-thème 1, l'avenir de l'enseignement supérieur africain après la COVID-19. Sous-thème 2, contribution des établissements d'enseignement supérieur africain pour le relevé des défis liés à la pandémie COVID-19. Sous-thème 3, contribution des établissements d'enseignement supérieur africain à la réalisation des objectifs de développement durable. Sous-thème 4, Financement des établissements d'enseignement supérieur africain face à une économie imprévisible. Sous thème 5, intégration de l'apprentissage en ligne et de la facture numérique. Sous thème 6, contribution de la diaspora à l'enseignement supérieur africain. Les participants attendus comprenant entre autres les ministères de l'enseignement supérieur, des universitaires, les chercheurs et organismes de recherche en Afrique et au-delà, les organismes éducatifs régionaux comme la IUCEA, la CAMES, la SARWA, le secteur privé organisé et les chefs d'industrie, les partenaires de développement, agences et organisations internationales et d'autres acteurs de l'éducation. La 15e conférence générale quadrina de l'AUALA. Pour vous inscrire et participer, veuillez visiter la tinyurl.com bar AAUGC 2021. Et pour plus d'informations sur la conférence, veuillez visiter le site web event.aau.org bar GenCon ou envoyez un courriel à secgen.aau.org et copiez info.aau.org. La UA, la voix de l'enseignement supérieur en Afrique. Welcome to 30 Minutes with HR, your premier human resource show for employers and employees. We have another exciting topic to discuss with you today. Avoiding job scams and red flags. What exactly do we mean? We have two very special guests that are joining us for today's episode and we'll introduce them when we come back. <laughs>
Everybody wants to be the best at what they do for the people they're doing it for. That's why, after 13 years of providing you with top-notch healthcare nationwide, the market leader in the private health insurance industry is going the extra mile for you. Instead of hopping from pharmacy to pharmacy, now you get your prescription drugs delivered straight to your doorstep. We will restock your chronic medication on the regular so you don't have to stress to keep track. We provide on-site clinics that offers you professional medical consultation from the comfort of your office. Enjoy these amazing benefits and so much more by signing on to Nationwide Medical Insurance today. Call us on 0800-222-222 or email us at info at nationwidemh.com. Nationwide, we go the extra mile so you don't have to join the healthcare family. Hello, welcome back to today's episode of 30 Minutes with HR. 30 Minutes with HR is a partnership program between KUSI Consultant and the Association of African Universities. And if you're watching today, we're actually live at the AH Hotel Executive Lounge. Today we're joined by Ms. Jennifer Agbisuya. She is the Human Resource Admin at ExxonMobil. E&M Ghana Deepwater Limited, and we're also joined by Juanita Opare. She is Kusi Consultants Junior, one of our junior consultants at KUSI Consultant. So welcome, ladies. Thank you. Are you excited about today's show? Yes, we yeah. are. So I'm not feeling the excitement. <laughs> I'm like, oh, if you're excited, we're excited okay. to be here. So tell us a bit about about yourself and your role at Exxon. Okay, uh, basically, um, Exxon Mobile Ghana, we're just still very new. Um, I, I, I would not want to go into so much detail. Well, basically, um, they're HR and admin, and okay. um, uh, that's what I do. Okay. So, we are looking to employ in the nearest future. Okay. Well, I'm sure our viewers are definitely <laughs> interested and excited to. Oh yes, we're looking for our that. engineers, Excellent. our you know, uh, yeah, engineers, okay. like petroleum people are into petroleum engineering and all of that. Okay. So, all right, um, yeah, they shouldn't worry. We have spaces and spots for them. Excellent. <laughs> At the end of the show, you can share with us how they can get okay. in touch with you as well. Great. And Juanita, welcome on set. Thank you, Rita. Is there anything you would like the viewers to, to know? My name is Juanita, like you said, and I work with Kusti Consulting. Um, we are an HR firm where we do recruiting and HR audits. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's get straight into today's topic. So we are discussing job scams. What exactly do we mean by, by job scams? And who are we speaking directly to when we talk about that? Okay. Um, basically, it's very simple. Job scam is advertising for positions that don't exist. Um, you have some people somewhere who just, you know, nowadays former nice coming foreigners. Uh, we have gold here. We have diamonds here. You know, they're all hip to it, so it doesn't work anymore. So some. Very smart people have gotten together. It's okay now. What is the what is the need in the society now? And the unemployment rate today is the highest problem we're facing. Our graduates can get a job. Um, people are either terminated or you know for whatever reason. So they become vulnerable. They become exactly. praised. And we have a lot of job sites that have been created to help facilitate people to be gainfully employed. So some of these sites, scammers go there, read your, because the sites require information about yourself. Exactly. Where you schooled, the kind of job you're looking for, you know, your major, where you studied and all of that. So what they do is they approach you. Hey, um, we are looking for, uh, let's say for example, uh, instrument engineer and this is how uh, much we are looking to pay because they have to pull you in okay. you know I don't know a lot of 
jobs that are genuine who will tell you how much they will pay you right off the bat exactly. until maybe an, after an interview. So to get back to your question, what is job scam? Job scam basically is putting an offer out there for jobs and positions that, that don't, don't exist. exist. Okay. And basically the scam comes in because they ask for money. Okay, you're not, you're not to pay money exactly. to you know exactly yeah so that is what jobs can okay. is. so I think um, you mentioned something about graduates this episode and it's just really really important right and I think even at the time that we're premiering this episode because this is the time that uh, there are a lot of graduates who are about to start applying for jobs if they haven't already. Right, so this episode is really supposed to help guide them okay. to know and understand what are the red flags they should look out for when they are applying for for jobs. Okay. And um, at KUSI Consultant, so when we do recruitment, we actually don't charge upfront fees. Okay. And that's one of the things that you mentioned. Yeah. So something to be mindful about, right? Yes. Wani, have you experienced any on the job, any, not on the job, but during your, your um, Searching. Searching. Yeah. Have you experienced any scams? Well, yeah, I have. I remember right after um, university, like she said, the unemployment rate is so high. Right. Exactly. So as a young um, person who just turned out from university, I was looking for opportunities because obviously most of the times where you do your service don't even consider hiring you after yep so this is a young girl who was looking forward to working yeah so i went through a lot of job sites and just like she said i'm sure sometimes they pick up that information from those sites so on this fateful day i got this message that i have been accepted not even for an interview i have been accepted outrightly but by then i didn't know all this okay. so i decided to what, pursue it so I, I i followed up on the uh, message i followed up so i called the number and then there was this gentleman that picked and asked me to 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 pay i think wow. by then it was a hundred series okay. yeah so he asked me to pay and then guess what it was to a mobile money account <laughs> This is ridiculous. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Wow. But then I was I was very vulnerable, you yeah, know. I course. was desperate. So I'm wow. like, okay, let me just follow this lead perhaps, just perhaps. And then I wasn't opportune to know all these things. So I mean, long story short, I was scammed. Wow. wow. Yeah. And wow. then also another thing to look out for is usually they promise you you have the role. But then you, so you hadn't even. I haven't even met anyone. the employer, no. Yeah, so I think that that <laughs> just sounds a bit funny. If exactly, you're this, exactly. Sure you already know, you know. But you mentioned something that I think is really important. When you are at that vulnerable stage in your life, yeah, you don't you're just consider. Out of school, yeah. How do you know how to tell if somebody's trying to scam you for for a job? So let's talk about some of the red flags. What obviously you want to make sure that you know the organization that's behind the, the role, right? Mm -hmm. So research, what else can we talk about? What advice can we give recent graduates and job seekers so that they don't fall victim to, to being scammed? So to add up to what I was saying, I think the organization appeared legit. I, 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 I might not mention the name of okay. the organization, yeah, but then it's a well-known organization. So I think wow. for now, they are more sophisticated. They don't even care as to i remember recently there's this um job opening offer that has been circulating and it's it's gasm okay gasm as we know it's it's a credible institution so you'd be tempted to what uh, to believe okay yeah but i think one red flag was the email address ah so you're saying that they they're using yeah a, it's like they're copying yeah the organization yeah wow they're mirroring the, another organization to scam. I wonder if Yasam knows that. <laughs> yeah, so they, there was there was actually a release to debunk that wow. um, advertisement. Wow. So what else? Like, what else is there to? Okay. What else can they look out for? Okay. Um, like she said, the first thing you should um, always take a note of is the email address. Sometimes 
they use the company's email, they're able to regenerate it. Um, it may not necessarily be in the order of, okay, for example, www.mtn.com. Uh, they could say www.mtn.h something something exactly. dot com. Exactly. So you have to be mindful of that. Secondly, uh, the second thing is you have to, another thing is, it's not all the time they use the company's email. Sometimes they could use the Gmail, the Gmail or account, Hotmail. like a personal account. Like a personal. You know that's a bit funny. That's a bit funny. Okay. And then secondly, um, some, like she said, they're very sophisticated. They would provide phone numbers. You would actually call and all of that. At that point, it's it's not easy to detect. Exactly. The time you you start, you, the red flag starts hitting you, is when they send you documentations through email. Like, okay, uh, we're sending you our interview document. Okay. So fill out your role, then they will ask you a question. Or tell us a little bit about yourself, your skills, blah, blah, blah. So they'll tell you, oh, it's a form of interview. Okay. And so when you fill it out, then immediately they respond. Like some two, three days later, oh, we are happy, we congratulate you, <laughs> you've been hired, you know, things like that. There is no genuine company that does that kind of interview. Exactly. There are two interviews, well, actually three. It's either a physical one-on-one, -on -one, and you get a proper invitation. Number two, you could do a voice, um, a phone call interview. Exactly. But then that is with a promise that after you pass that, they you will meet. In -person you actually. have an in-person with Sahara Oil, you know, and so you would have a link. There, there's so many things that go into... It's a process. It's a process. There's so a someone process. just providing you one email and not putting other people in copy or enough. links. It's, it's not enough. No, those, those are just very fake. There's a process. So It's a process. And I think people need to be more mindful as you to do a lot of our recruitment. But like you mentioned, it's a process, right? So once the candidates have been shortlisted, then we call them to have an over-the-phone interview. If they are within our area, then we meet with them, and we actually meet with them in person. We discuss what the benefits, what the role, um, the job, uh, what do you call it, the job description, what all the benefits that the role comes with, right? And then, so, but if the candidate is not in the area, then we do a video conference call. So you still get to see the face of the panel. Exactly, so you get all this information, you know. So, so far we've discussed being mindful of the email address. Obviously, if they're asking you to pay, you need to be aware, you need to be careful. We don't charge up front to recruit um, candidates for a position, right? And another thing too is, there's, your gut feeling will never lie to you. I've been a victim of a scam, it wasn't employment. But if it doesn't feel right, right, and if you have any doubts, yeah, you get a bit excited because you need a job, you need to work. But at the end of the day, if you're gonna lose money and just, you, you lose out on so much by being a victim of a scam. So yeah. obviously research into the organization that you are looking to work with. Absolutely. You know, I want to tell you uh, 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 no, uh, 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 an example, sure. because that is what is really prevalent now is um, people willing to travel. Yes. So you, you get people who would approach you through LinkedIn, through all this uh, official sites. And um, OK, my example, uh, my, the scam I went through, even though I actually didn't notice it was a scam, um, they would approach you and then uh, send you uh, interview documentations and all of that. And so, right off the back, oh, we're going to pay you 10,000 US dollars. They will give you a really a juicy <laughs> salary. Sounds good, right? Sounds good. <laughs> you know, a driver, chauffeur, whatever. And this was by Sinopec, one of the biggest oil and gas companies in the world in China. And then uh, they, they, they said all the nice stuff. Now, this is where you should know that it's a scam. Number one. Every expatriate that comes into this country, if you also want to be an expatriate, okay, you are not to pay for your residential permit, exactly. for your work permit. The company takes they care, take care of, of everything, you. your exactly. flight, all of that. Once someone tells you, oh, you're supposed to start 
let's say, um, in July. So we need your residence. So within a week, it should, the, your resident permit should be ready. So send us uh, X amount of money. We have a lo our lawyer, uh, contractor lawyer, work with them. They'll give you another email address. He would now come and tell you, oh yeah, we've submitted your name already to the wow. Chinese embassy. We just need you to send $500. Wow. And it will go on and on. Please note, resident permit, work permit in anywhere in any country never takes a week. It could take six months, one year. Sometimes if you are on a project for six months, let's say in Dubai, you might go there the six months, your work permit or your resident might not be ready. You might have to do that 20, uh, 28 days, 28 days rotation, exactly. which is to go and come. Okay. It takes a while. It takes a while. It so takes a while. you see people, oh yeah, I'm going to Dubai. The person is going to arrange my visa. Wow. Is this and that. A friend of mine was offered a job by UN. It was a jobs camp. He resigned his, forget that we reimburse you. Send, and this went on for a little while. By the time they were done with him, this guy had coughed out almost $10,000. Oh my goodness. Got to Dubai, there was nobody. Who was he sending that money to? He was sending it to the organization. Yeah, to the organization, so called oh, organization. Wow. So he got to Dubai, got stuck, and he had to now beg for money to oh. come back to Ghana. It's real out there. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 real it's, out. it's so bad. You have to be so careful you have to nowadays. Be careful. You have to be careful. And not just not oh. just job seekers too, right? Employers also have to be careful because exactly. if somebody is mirroring your yeah. organization, okay. I mean an organization like the And you're not aware to be able to use that name. So yes. it's it's like a whole new world with yes. Digital technology. You can get scammed in Ghana by someone who's <laughs> in the US. You can get scammed in the US by someone in Dubai. So it's you have to really just be mindful. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And to so. Go, to no, go ahead and then we'll Okay, to add up to that. the first part, okay. which is on the part of the employee, usually they bring out this ridiculous job description. Mm. And then you can't even marry that with the um, salary. Really? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, outrageous salary and then there's this ridiculous job description. Like it's vague. Okay. You, don't, you, don't, you don't even know what exactly. Wow. The yeah, the job description exactly. It, it gives wow. it away. Yeah, again, it's that gut feeling, right? If the job even looks or sounds funny, then yeah, yeah. you have every right as a job seeker to question. As I always say, ask questions and do research. Absolutely. You know, you can you can definitely make that happen. We are going to take a short break and we'll be right back. When we come back, we have a, a different side to discuss of this whole job scam situation. We'll be right back. Hotel East Legon, where every stay is unique. Welcome to Adanze Travels Product Knowledge Series. And I'm excited to talk to you about our FIT tour service, where you get the opportunity to customize the product to your taste. And with that, we take your details, your destination you want to go, the date you want to travel. We're able to do it to suit your budget. So you don't need to worry about breaking the bank when you are traveling with this kind of service. You can visit us as the details are on the screen, as you see, or you can call us on the numbers showing on the screen. Let's plan your trip for you. And you know with our dancing, we always let you feel the beauty of life. Our dancing travel feels life's beauty. Welcome back. You 
have joined us today for another episode of 30 Minutes with HR, your premier human resource show for employers and employees. We're having such a great conversation. We've already touched up on job scams. Now we are getting into red flags. What do we mean by red flags? And this is actually more of what the employer should look out for. Yeah, so let's let's go right in. Okay. Um, of course, every company wants to hire good people. Exactly. It's such a waste of effort and resource to always have to recruit because you're not able to get the right people. And getting the right people is also a process. And um, there are some few red flags you need to really look out for. Number one, uh, if you're doing an interview for uh, looking to recruit some applicants during the interview process, an applicant should be able to look you in the eye. That's always the number one. Number one. The eye contact. The eye contact. <laughs> maintain eye contact because then it shows confidence. I wouldn't want to recruit somebody who is not confident because then that tells me you can't deliver. Confidence basically drives everything. Mm -hmm. Once the confidence level is off, trust me, the person cannot perform. They have something to... Exactly. Number two is uh, somebody who uh, is their, their, their CV, they lie. People, oh, do you know SQL? Yes. Okay, tell us about SQL. I'm an expert in X SQL. Tell us about that. Um, uh, but yeah, it's on the CV. <laughs> <laughs> It's on the CV, we get it all you know, the time. And funny enough, some employers or the people doing the interview, they are so tired, disconnected, that they actually really don't go through don't pick it up. the CV. Yes. So it's easy to just lose track. So if you're able to just pinpoint something, okay, you said you're an expert in this, explain this to me. And the person is not able to tell you because some people they're smart they try to go around it or maybe they've read on it and they've forgotten so number two the person should be able to technically describe what they claim they know exactly number three is um uh, what else you should have a question if after i'm done with you and you don't have any question for me that tells me that you are you're not proactive that tells me that you will cut corners to achieve uh your goal okay, okay. your goal not the company's goal your goal is let me just do whatever exactly. you know so that is always one of the major problems we face is people just are not motivated to give their best so when you don't ask me questions not like you have to but when you do, when an applicant does, okay. the applicant stands out. Because then he tells me you've done your research. You want to know if you know your stuff. You have questions for me. OK, this role you have advertised, or you're looking to fill. I think, what, what, uh, what, if I do it this, this way, do you think this would help the company? You know, you ask questions, and that would tell me from your question. I'm able to tell, oh, no, this person is really good at what they do. And then before I sort of give my my sweet lady here a chance, <laughs> I wouldn't want to say all. It's um, fine. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, another thing that I personally look out for for a red flag is uh, preparation. Preparation, and that that boils down to everything. The way you dress. I don't expect you to come to an interview with bangles and with chewing gum. Sometimes you hide it, but when you're talking, I see it. I just see it. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, I asked you, okay, have you, what do you know about us? Oh, sorry, I, I didn't have time to check uh, about your car. Please, when you're that's, going that's for an interview, flag. is yes, a huge red flag. You should tell me when we started, how much you think we are worth, what, where we are hoping to, please. Do, do your research. Do your research. Do your research. I always research. say that. Oh. But it's I just so our eye contact and um because there are a lot of people who might say I know it shows confidence right but at the, when you interview someone sometimes they could be a little nervous yeah. so maybe the eye contact might not be there as much. Okay. Is that something that would be a deal breaker for you? Like if you interviewed a candidate and they're not maintaining. Okay. okay. It depends on the role. Okay. Some roles. 
uh, like for example the the graduates, you know, someone who is no experience just coming in. Uh, that you know, you, you know, you can't expect so much. So it depends. For for a new graduate coming in, I don't really focus so much on the body language because you're here for us to also build you up and all of that. But I am more concerned about your level of enthusiasm. Exactly. If I ask you a question and you're like, please, I don't know. Come on. You can say, okay, I'm, I, I don't understand, but can you explain? If you don't know, I said, please, I, I, I don't really know this. So the, that's, it's also, I think that it's, we're talking about honesty here, right? Honesty. Don't lie if you don't know something. Like, be very honest. Thank you. You said it. You said yeah. it, Rita. <laughs> so, Juanita, what? Do you have anything? Yeah, you? for me, um, I, I mean, I was listening to you and at least I heard you say it depends on the role. Because sometimes when you go for interviews, you are nervous. That doesn't mean you can't deliver. Exactly. Yeah, so it depending on what the person is coming to do, sometimes you need to, you know, um, understand where the person is also coming from. It, it, for me, you just need to be able to learn you should come with that um that that um what do you call it yeah, yeah you should come <laughs> with that <laughs> you should come with that because wait, wait, if you want to learn then i'm sure within six months one year you should be able exactly. to rise yeah. yeah so for me you should ha just have that i just want to learn i just want to learn i just want to learn and then you could they could actually turn you into anything once the processes, once the environment is also very conducive. And then, like she said, people also lie on their CVs. So the interview is, 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 is that defining moment. Okay, so you have listed ABC on your CV. The interview should showcase the extent to which you can deliver, like your competencies and, and all that. Yeah, and then you should be, have been able to do a, 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 some level of research on the company. Exactly. You can't just, just show up. And exactly, then you can't just it. show up yeah. and that doesn't flag, work. Sorry, a huge one is don't ever go late for so an interview. interview. Don't go to an interview without an extra CV. Okay, go get there on time, go with an extra documentation, go with every documentation that they may ask for that role. Just in case. Yes. Just in case. Go for come it. Yes. You always do that. Like, make sure you bring your certificates, you know, your How can you license, come in and bring anything? Bring something, yes. Do not come empty-handed. Do not come empty-handed. You know, I think, I mean, obviously, because of the unemployment rate, a lot of people, I think, they want to add a bit to their CV, <laughs> right, to make themselves stand out and be able to get the job. There's nothing wrong with embellishing just a little bit, right? And by that I mean, you want to say something about yourself, your experience, but you want to find the best possible way to say it. It doesn't mean you should lie and say, I have 10 years of experience, or really you have like two years of experience, you know, or that you've, you've had all these technical job skills. Gaps. Yes, exactly. Why? Because, because recruiters can actually pick up some of this. And they may, even if they don't pick it up, right? when they are reviewing your CV, when you get to the interview, every, it's going to show, because yes. they'll end up asking you a question and you'll <laughs> be stuck there. So you don't want to make that bad impression, because if, for instance, and, and it might not even be what gets you the job. Nowadays, employers are yeah. looking for mm -hmm. soft skills, like real practical yes. skills, yes. right? Yes. Yes. How do you network? Um, are you confident? How are your communication skills? Yes. So a lot of those technical things might not even work. So just be honest. I think that, that I want just be very honest and say the things about you that you need to say, but be very like honest about it and just say it in the best possible way. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's what I would say. To add up to that, um, um, in terms of the C with the length, I don't see why an entry level African <laughs> should have about this is like a whole five pages. <laughs> you know, it <laughs> doesn't. <laughs> it, it doesn't yeah. make sense because exactly. if you are reviewing like thousands of um, um, CVs, how do you make yours stand out? And if yours is about five pages, who has time? Who has time for that? Yeah. Especially for entry level, exactly, role, right? exactly. That's just a bit. It's a bit much. Yeah. So I think. 
some people just go, go bit, over the board. Yeah. So let's keep it simple yep. and straight to the point. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Is there anything else that any advice that we would want to give employers and employees, things that they need to be mindful of? Okay, okay, another thing that I think perhaps maybe we should also look at is employers noticing uh, red flags, the, employ the applicants themselves should also notice red flags in the companies exactly. they're going to ap apply for. Is exactly. Some companies just, they're not worth yep. working for. It goes both ways. It goes it's both so ways. Goes if, both I, if I may ways. say, Rita, um, one of the things we have to look out for when applying for a company is number one, a company should respect your time. I can't call you at 7 a.m. this morning and tell you to come for an interview at 11 a.m. And if, 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 I, if, you t if I tell you, oh, sorry, I won't be able to come, then you tell the person, then sorry, you don't have a chance. You should always allow people, give the people an opportunity to prepare. So true. call a week ahead, it's also a few true. days ahead. That's a red flag. You don't want to work for a company who, when you get there for your interview, they're late. It shows they're not prepared. It shows they don't value your time. And once a company does not value your time, they can't. They won't value your input. Exactly. So these are some of the things you need to look out for as an applicant uh, or someone looking for a job. The kind of companies you want to give your effort and your time to. And also salary, right? I yes, also salary as we well. We live in this culture where employers don't pay on time or they might mm -hmm. take on. No, we actually have a situation with it's a former client because okay. we just didn't we didn't agree with with their practice. So we okay. were hiring a candidate for this client. The candidate said, "Oh, I've heard they don't pay on time." Oh. So we did our research and, and we true. answered his question. You know, we said, "Yeah, this is the feedback that we're getting from some of the employees. They wow. don't pay on time." And surprisingly, he was willing to still go and work for the organization. Oh. He's desperate. Yeah, because he's desperate. You know, but I just thought like why you know we need to be able to i think adopt a culture where we are paying and because for me i probably wouldn't want to work for an organization that would probably take months to to, to pay, pay. Me a salary. because yes. what does that say about their financial position exactly too, right? what does that say exactly so you have to kind of look out for these things and yes. to me they are all red flags you have to and yeah. you also have to ask yourself what are you hoping to gain from no, working with the organization exactly. from the employer? Yes. If they, their culture doesn't answer those questions for exactly. you, then you may want to look for something else. Exactly. You know, it's the honest truth because employees need to understand that they have just as much of a right, right. as employers do. Absolutely. Do your research yes. and figure it out for yourself whether or Absolutely. not this is an organization you, yes. want, to, you want to work with. So. Um, to add up to that, I think as a job seeker, too, you need to look at the turnover rate mm -hmm. of that yeah. organization. It's very important. It's very, very, very important. That tells you a lot. Yes. Yeah. So you should ask questions. Basically, who, who when was the, 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 the my your predecessor? What happened? Why did he leave? You need to prove. You need to ask a lot yeah, of questions. That's yeah. actually the number one you, question you, that I think people should have. Yeah. Yes. You, you, you need to ask a lot of questions. Exactly. Like, why did this role become available? Exactly. Because you're the one going to fill it. So yes. That's actually a good one. Yes. So turnover time and salary and, salary. and culture yeah, compensation and culture. And culture. Culture is another culture. one. Culture is another one. Yes. So these are these are all red flags. If yes. they don't meet with your objective and why you are willing to work with that organization, then you might as well start looking elsewhere. Yay! So <laughs> this has been an interesting conversation. Can you tell our viewers where they can find out more information about your organization and whether or not you're hiring, how do they apply, all this good stuff? www.exxonmobile Ghana.com. Uh, we are looking to, we're new, so we're definitely, once we are ready to employ, we, I mean, that is part of what this international, com that's part of what we require okay. for international companies is to recruit our graduates. And if you need help recruiting, you know who to come <laughs> to for that. The sick Yes, Juanita, <laughs> myself. <laughs> 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 Definitely. In favor. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely.
Okay. Good. Have I have I said enough for you? More? No, no. Well, if you want to say more, but I think it's good. So okay. they have an idea of your website and yes. how they can get in touch. Yes. And I'm turning it over to you. Yeah. Just so <laughs> you can actually follow us at Kusi Consulting on LinkedIn and on Facebook. And as and when we have um, job vacancies, we'll definitely keep you in our we'll let you know exactly. Yeah. And another thing, because of this episode, I think we spoke a lot to graduates and also job seekers. If you need any advice, any consultancy advice in terms of things to look out for, the red flags, employers as well, you can get in touch with us and we'll be able to assist through our consultation. So thank you ladies for joining us thank today. You. Thank you. And thank you viewers for watching today. Thank you to AH Hotel for letting us use this amazing space, the executive lounge. Um, thank you for tuning in once again, and we will see you next week. Are you an institution or individual? Do you intend to organize a memorable event to be archived for future reference? Then look no further than AAU Studios because it's your best bet with our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4K Panasonic video cameras, Kinoflow lights, assorted microphones, live streaming equipment, among others, you are sure to get the best of productions. Visit us at Trinity Avenue, East Ligon, adjacent the National Accreditation Board, or contact the AAU Studios via the following email addresses, info at aau.org, aautv at aau.org, or ransford at aau.org. Alternatively, you can call us on plus 233-244-736280. Good day, Africa. This is Event Update on AAU TV, the voice of higher education in Africa. Event Update is all about information on upcoming higher education events and scholarship opportunities in Africa. And it is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. My name is Isabella Teta Hinakwa. The Continental Education Strategy for Africa Higher Education Series is inviting proposals from African and diaspora academics, scholars, recent graduates and development practitioners for original essays to contribute to this volume on research and graduate studies in African higher education system. The topic should be one of these. Introduction, Research and Graduate Studies in Post-Pandemic Africa building research collaboration, cooperation and networking in Africa, future of research funding in Africa, governance and capacity building for graduate studies in African universities, research for ICT development in Africa, Africa's research needs and challenges of doing research in Africa and many more. The series seeks to systematically develop evidence-based information through a comprehensive framework of collaborative scholarly and professional participation with clear consequences for strategy, dialogue and actions from a continental viewpoint driven by the African Union's Agenda 23 Blueprint Compass. Proposals should include 200 words abstract focused on a chosen topic, a two-page outline of the chapter and description of what you will cover a recent CV that clearly indicates your country of origin and residence 
and the list of your main publications. Interested authors are to submit their proposal before 20th April 2021. And for more information, email cesarresearchbook at gmail.com. La Continental Education Strategy for Africa Higher Education Series invite les propositions des universitaires africains et diasporiens, des universitaires, des diplômés récents et des participants du développement pour des saisies originaux afin de contribuer à ce volume sur la recherche et les études supérieures dans le système d'enseignement supérieur en Afrique. Le sujet devrait en être en introduction, recherche et études supérieures en Afrique post-pandémique, bâtir la collaboration, la coopération et la mise en réseau de la recherche en Afrique, l'avenir du financement de la recherche en Afrique et aussi le gouvernance et renforcement des capacités pour les études supérieures dans les universités africaines. Recherche pour le développement des TIC en Afrique et aussi besoin de recherche en Afrique et défis de faire de la recherche en Afrique et bien d'autres. La série vise à développer systématiquement des informations factuelles à travers un cadre complet de participation universitaire et professionnelle collaborative avec des conséquences claires pour la stratégie, le dialogue et les actions d'un point de vue continental, piloté par la boussole imprimée de l'agenda 2063 de l'Union africaine. Les propositions doivent inclure un résumé de 200 mots axés sur le sujet choisi, un aperçu de deux pages de chapitre et une description de ce que vous couvriez. Un CV récent qui indique clairement votre pays d'origine et de la résidence et répertoire vos publications principales. Les auteurs intéressés doivent soumettre leurs propositions avant le 20 avril 2021. Pour plus d'informations par email, envoyez à CESA researchbook.gmail.com. The Rotary Peace Fellowship is pleased to announce that application for the fully funded fellowship is open for dedicated leaders from around the world to study as one of their peace centers. The Rotary Peace Centers program strengthens the potential of peace and development professionals or practitioners through academic preparation, practice and global networking opportunities to become skilled and successful catalysts for peace. Interested candidates must be proficient in English, have a bachelor's degree, a strong commitment to cross-cultural understanding, potential for leadership, and must have at least three years of full-time work experience in peace or development. Applicants are to submit their online application to the Rotary Foundation before 15th May 2021. Visit www.rotary.org for more information. Rotary Peace Fellowship est heureuse d'annoncer que la demande de bourse entièrement financée est ouverte aux dirigeants dévoués du monde entier pour étudier dans l'un de leurs centres de paix. Le programme des centres de paix rotatifs renforce le potentiel des professionnels ou des participants de la paix et du développement grâce à la préparation académique, à la pratique et aux opportunités de réseautage mondial pour devenir des catalyseurs qualifiés et efficaces pour la paix. Le candidat intéressé doit être compétent en anglais, avoir un baccalauréat, un engagement fort envers la compréhension interculturelle, un potentiel de leadership et doit avoir au moins trois ans d'expérience de travail à temps plein en paix ou en développement. Les candidats doivent soumettre leur candidature en ligne à la Fondation Rotative avant le 15 mai 2021. Visitez le www.retreat.org pour plus d'informations. Applications for the World Bank Robert McNamara Fellowship Program, RSMFP, is open to inspire development economics researchers from developing countries with World Bank research economists creating unique opportunities for the fellows to participate in rigorous policy relevant research. Applicants will have a unique opportunity to widen their perspective on potential development questions and how their research can address challenges in the developing countries. 
To be eligible, applicants must be nationals of World Bank WBG member countries graduates of MA level studies, not more than 35 years of age, and must be available to relocate to Washington, D.C. for the duration of the fellowship. Interested applicants should submit a resume, statement of purpose in PDF file, contact of at least one academic reference, and writing sample. This application is open till 30th April 2021. And for more information, email rsm underscore fellowships at Wordbank.org. Les Robert MC Namara de la Banque mondiale sont ouvertes pour inspirer les chercheurs en économie du développement des pays et développement les économistes de la recherche de la Banque mondiale, créant des opportunités uniques pour les boursiers de participer à des recherches rigoureuses pertinentes pour les politiques. Les candidats auront une occasion unique d'élargir leur point de vue sur les questions de développement potentiel et comment leurs recherches peuvent relever des défis dans le monde en développement. Âgés de plus de 35 ans et doivent être disponibles pour déménager à Washington DC pendant la durée de la bourse. Les candidats intéressés doivent soumettre un curriculum vital, une déclaration de tension dans un fichier PDF, un contact avec au moins une référence académique et un échantillon écrit. L'application est ouverte jusqu'au 30 avril 2021 et pour plus d'informations, par email envoyé à la Conference on Research in Teaching and Education is calling for paper for the third World Conference on Research in Teaching and Education, which is scheduled from 23rd to 25th April 2021. This conference seeks to provide an international platform for the academicians, researchers, managers, industrial participants, and students to share their research findings with global experts. Interested authors are to submit their paper online via www.worldte.org slash online submission. And for more information, contact info at worldte.org or visit www.worldte.org. La Conférence mondiale sur la recherche dans l'enseignement et l'éducation appelle à un document pour la troisième Conférence mondiale sur la recherche dans l'enseignement et l'éducation qui est prévue du 23 au 25 avril 2021. Cette conférence vise à fournir une plateforme internationale aux académiciens, chercheurs, gestionnaires, participants industriels et étudiants pour partager leurs recherches avec des experts mondiaux. Les auteurs intéressés doivent soumettre leurs articles en ligne via www.worldti.org barre online submission. Pour plus d'informations, contactez info.worldti.org ou visitez le www.worldti.org. Applications for the Mandela Rhodes Foundation, MRF Postgraduate Scholarship 2022, is open for young Africans to study in South Africa. The foundation offers young leaders from across the African continent a chance to become part of Nelson Mandela's legacy of transformative impact. It also provides a once-in-a-lifetime platform for professional advancement through a coveted postgraduate scholarship and leadership development initiative for those who wish to use their talents to help Africa. Interested scholars should be between the ages of 20 and 29 citizen of any African country and have a first degree with above average academic results. Applicants should apply online and upload needed documents, essays and recommendation letters before 20th April 2021. Visit www.mandelaroads.org for more information. Candidature à la Bourse d'études supérieures 2021 de la Fondation Mandela Roads pour les jeunes Africains à étudier en Afrique du Sud. La Fondation offre aux jeunes leaders de tout le continent africain une chance de faire partir de l'héritage d'impact transformateur de Nelson Mandela. 
il fournit également une plateforme unique pour l'avancement professionnel grâce à une initiative convoitée de bourse d'études supérieures et de la développement du leadership pour ceux qui souhaitent utiliser leurs talents pour aider l'Afrique. Les universitaires intéressés devraient être âgés de 20 à 29 ans, citoyens de tous les pays africains et avoir un premier diplôme avec le résultat académique supérieur à la moyenne. Les candidats doivent postuler en ligne et télécharger les documents, essais et lettres de recommandations nécessaires avant le 20 avril 2021. Visitez le www.mandelarose.org bar scholarships for plus d'information. That is all for today's update. Events update is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. Please follow us on our social media platforms at Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, AAU TV underscore African Universities on Twitter, and AAU Official on Instagram. You can also visit our dedicated website at tv.aau.org for more of events updates. My name is Isabella Tisahinakwa. Je suis Imelda Amoudi. On all our social media platforms, Association of African Universities on Facebook, and also again, Association of African Universities on YouTube as well. And this is a special edition of AU Talks brought to you by the Association of African Universities, and my name is Kwesi Sam. Now, throughout the COVID pandemic, the AU Television has been bringing you exciting, insightful, and the best discussions on COVID-19, especially how universities are surviving in Africa. And today, we'll be hosting one of our finest academics on another important aspect of COVID-19. We'll be looking at how universities um, are well positioned and able to transition um, into blended learning and also look at post-secondary education delivery in Africa as well. You can join the conversation via social media pl platforms like I rightly mentioned. Join us, send your questions and let's get the discussions going. We'll just go for a quick break and when we return, I'll let you know who my guest is. Stay tuned. Are you an institution or individual? Do you intend to organize a memorable event to be archived for future reference? Then look no further than AAU Studios because it's your best bet with our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4K Panasonic video cameras, KinoFlow lights, assorted microphones, live streaming equipment, among others, you are sure to get the best of productions. Visit us at Trinity Avenue, East Ligon, adjacent the National Accreditation Board, or contact the AAU Studios via the following email addresses, info at aau.org, aautv at aau.org, or ransford at aau.org. Alternatively, you can call us on plus 233-244-736280. This is AAU Television, and we are hosting Dr. Um, Barry, and he is the vice chancellor at the International Open University in the Gambia. We are discussing COVID-19 and we are looking at a dimension which looks at um, post-secondary education delivery in Africa. We are privileged to be hosting you, Doug. How are you doing? Thank you very much, Mr. Sam. I'm really pleased to join you on the Great. platform. Great. 
All right. So you are, or your university is one of the few open universities we have in Africa. And um, we would like to find out from you how your university has been surviving the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of teaching, learning, um, community engagement, and research as well. Thank you very much. Um, I guess the most important thing to recognize from the perspective of our university mm. is that we are almost at 100% uh, okay. online. When I say almost, I know some few courses have been conducted in few of our campuses around the, uh, around the, con around the globe. Um, notably, for example, at the headquarters mm. in the Gambia, where we have some few classes on English to create a British students and other international students, non-English speaking, to get out mm. to our programs. But if you look at the COVID-19, we can say safely that it has revealed a lot of issues, particularly in Africa, where we have almost, uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, uh, just about 6% of people going mm -hmm. to university, uh, mainly because of our uh, access, mainly because of access. Uh, simply um, put, when we have a university convention, call it sometimes tradition. Absolutely. Huh? Mm. What is requires students students a collection of books that would allow them to conduct their programs mm. and eventually graduate uh, exceptionally and I say exceptionally here because there has always been a doubt whether online university is really a credible thing to launch. Um, online universities all over the world today are now noticing that with the COVID-19, there is a chance that the student's education mm -hmm. is not disrupted. The International Open University has continued giving its courses. Um, the only challenge is that in, 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 Africa, in the African continent, access to internet mm -hmm. is very limited. And this was the reason why, in most cases, we have centers that have been built to allow access to at least a very limited uh, number of kilometers. Okay. But access internet, they are able to follow their courses, they are able to do their assignments, they are able to interact with mm. their lecturers as if nothing has happened during the COVID-19. All right. So, Dr. Bai, it means so that, that uh, if I'm not it means that your university has um, all the processes and has the platform. And like I am indicated um, early on, most of our um, educational stakeholders are discussing and engaging. And the, the, the consensus is that blended learning is the way to go. What lessons must we learn from your university if all our traditional universities are also transitioning into blended learning? What um, lessons or what are the key issues that they must um, take into consideration? This is why there must be a paradigm shift mm. today in the way we see post-secondary education. A paradigm shift because, one, we have tried and tested traditional universities. We have realized that we cannot give access to all the students that we have in our continent. If you look at the figures, the, the figures mm. are very low when it comes to access to post-secondary education. Some countries have really survived by giving, spreading the secondary education up to secondary education across their, their countries. But when it comes to university education, it's an expensive mm -hmm. venture. So it will require probably that students have to travel distances, go and stay in um, clusters uh, across the conventional universities. Today, we are rethinking mm -hmm. higher education. We are rethinking even secondary education. What we need to do now is to converge, and I'm happy that the Association of African Universities has taken the lead in mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that the one and also our policy makers, we, we begin hybrid to start with. Okay. Where students can still have the convention, which is administrative. allow us to 
students who are across our houses. Mm. We have to develop curricula that's to that kind of area to that should correspond to that has tested several systems and today we are happy to say of very very advanced lunch to go through their four year of education mm -hmm. online have come out with exceptional results we have developed the, with some admissions in most of the Asian we have demonstrated it of research. Some of these students have, have been uh, John, uh, scientific mm. journals. So we have started modestly, uh, basically not to pay a heavy, which is also one of the advantages people on because it could require a lot, mm -hmm. lot of resources because the nature of their operation. But one day is had is something that might be required is probably the student needs. That is a laptop phone, a phone or whatever. That would allow the person the access Great dog. to the course. Yes. Even this um, even even this mm -hmm. within technology, there's a of improving that all right now you you, you bring in an, an interesting aspect um if we are going either hybrid or we are going blended approach we need um internet infrastructure we need laptops and equipment and it's so interesting that on the continent 70 percent of our students especially in the tertiary institutions do not have access to laptops and those who even have do not have access to internet now Taking into consideration that that is the, the, the new way or the, the new methods that we want to transition into, how do we ensure that students have access to this equipment to be able to have smooth and excellent um, academic um, engagement? Well, uh, it's important to note that today uh, with the technology going around the world, basically, uh, as mm -hmm. that's, that's incredible. It does you might be surprised to find that at least one out of or two out of every five families there is a smartphone amongst themselves. Well, that is a mm. good next government to, to create points. Now, now I important to see internet, not for a long time, for a very few mm -hmm. brief moments, that would allow at least for you your assignment and to of Days, because you see, you can access this course through a lot of other um, platforms. Mm -hmm. We can create what we call offline access to the course. It's allow you to read your course, cut the videos, to 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 read the book, get yourself familiar with it until the time that you need to do an assignment. Then you prepare your assignment. You do the assignment mm -hmm. online, and once you do it offline, rather, then you go and do a connection. The moment you do the connection, the moment it's connected. It will automatically, you know, download or upload your your assignment to the platform. So this is a very good way to save cost, but at the same time, it's a good way of decentralizing education with a minimal uh, infrastructure. Right. Then, so there mm -hmm. must be a way that that government uh, embark into a, a minimal expenditure, minimal in the sense that it will not require much because you can even uh, give the private sector to mm. do that, so that you have what we call collection points accessible at least within a very small cluster all, all, all over all right. the country. So m most importantly, we um, are looking at the various subject disciplines in the universities. Um, some experts feel that um, it is much more easier to adopt um, these methods when you are running um, art or humanity programs. But in terms of the skill base, like the TVET, and that is a technical vocational education, and also um, that of the, the physical science-based programs where you need to go to the laboratory, you need to do some experiment, you need to do some practicals. How do we ensure quality, and how do we make sure that these processes are also possible um, using the technology-based or enhanced tools that we have in existence? Thank you very much. I think we cannot uh, uh, rule out the fact that there are still some a lot of uh, gap. I mean, a lot of areas we need to uh, knock our heads together mm -hmm. to improve mm -hmm. and develop. 
Info science courses, naturally, when you're doing chemistry, biology, etc., you need to do some little practicals to further strengthen your, your, your background and your knowledge Absolutely. in those areas. Um, but let us also look at it from a critical mm. perspective. You know, um, let's say, for example, in the area of skills, we have to develop what we call mastercraft mm -hmm. systems. Mastercraft systems will allow an identification in every area, a village or a, a, a city or whatever, Certain um, skills that have already been developed recognize those those people and then ensure that those people are given some minimal training on how to supervise, mm. you know, how to supervise the students and how eventually um, somebody, an inspector or somebody will come around and verify through an interaction with them on how the performance was going, going on, what and what they were able to achieve or produce, mm. etc. So there are ways where you can decentralize this that would empower people, that would encourage a lot of people who are probably into their master crafts. Like, for example, somebody doing uh, mm -hmm. mechanics, um, you can do mechanic training on the ground. You can do the theory on, um, as, I, as we have agreed, but then the training the, the could be a kind of an, an apprenticeship system. And eventually what you do is there's a supervision that will come that way and then improve on it. So this will have two advantages. One, it will allow the student to be learning on the ground, hands on. It's most important, improving on theory through the assessments and the courses that are being conducted. And it will also empower the people who are within the cluster who know the students, certainly because it's a family member, but at the same time, increase if there is more um, attachment with industry with mm -hmm. whom. Because they will say, okay, for the first time, people will come on board, students will come on board, who when qualified, they don't need to travel distances to look for jobs, and eventually this industry will grow. We are talking about agricultural industries. We are talking about uh, mechanical mm -hmm. farming. This can happen on the ground. You don't need people to travel long distances to do the practicals. And they, you can, uh, around agriculture, there's a lot you can do about it. We are talking about animal husbandry. A lot of biological causes can be attached to it. We are talking about uh, environmental causes. We are talking about uh, other skill, hands-on training on the ground. So it's a, it's a way of developing a policy that would have an all-inclusive mm. system where everybody plays a role in the education of the children around their environment. And I think this is possible. It, it, it just needs to be more refining, more discussion. And I'm sure if policymakers are ready, this can be can be discussed and it can. can All be right, I, I think yeah, you are right. Um, you bring in another interesting um, aspect, and that has to do with policy. And you will agree with me that uh, in terms of education delivery on a continent, it has the policy implications and the policy perspectives. Do you think that policymakers um, on a continent, and I'm talking about education ministries, I'm talking about the various governments, uh, are really ready and they see some of these issues from the perspective that we are seeing? Yes, um, well, I have to say that uh, COVID-19 has been a very good uh, mm. teacher in that because it has doubled the, the, the whole systems. And all of a sudden, we have started uh, embracing a little bit of open and distance learning. Now, this should be a lesson, a, t a lesson for us to start re re rethinking our policies. I have to say that, yes, most of our policies have never taken into consideration um, uh, serious access Mm. To education around the whole uh, continent. As a result, we have always failed. You know, sub Saharan Africa, for example, the, the access to uh, higher education is very limited. As a result, uh, most of the students that we have, most of the people that we have, are, are not as productive as the continent mm -hmm. would require. We have a lot of resources that are untapped. You know, we are talking of natural resources. And what we are doing now, we are improving, asking people to come from abroad after so many years of independence to tap those resources. Petroleum. Petrol is being discovered. We have diamonds. We have bauxite. We have, uh, uh, um, how do you call it, um, um, uh, 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 gold. And then we also have our natural God-given environment. We have the forest. We have the land, arable land, etc. So what we will now have to do is to rethink our policies. We have to realize that uh, we need to have change the whole concept of post-secondary education delivery. In order to be able to have an all-inclusive system, um, the trials would be a difficult one. The, the, the challenges will be there. And, and I'm telling you, once we launch this and we have, it will require most, most probably to, to implement it, 
we can start with pilot programs with some schools or with some communities and eventually we can roll it out but you see we have to be committed if we want to achieve the goals of getting a well-educated um, um, uh, members mm -hmm. of the continent to advance on the continent to improve on, on our achievements to improve this continent to be independent from uh, from other uh, sources of funding to be able to raise our own funds we need our own experts and we cannot get this until we start rethinking education until we create a serious paradigm shift in the education delivery all right so you are one of the best uh, vice chancellors we have in our open universities and i want to I don't want to put you um, on a spot, but I want to ask you, what is the strategy that your university is putting across? For example, if I'm asking you from your, your expert point of view, if you are being asked to submit um, kind of a draft of what you think uh, policymakers should be looking at in terms of um, post-secondary um, education delivery on a continent, what are some of the things that you think are very innovative, they are achievable, they are very cost-effective to implement? What exactly will you share with us? Well, first of all, you have to realize that uh, when you talk about uh, uh, online education that we are proposing, our access is not only limited to students coming from mm. the secondary school. Ironically, we have a lot of uh, our own population who are not educated. And naturally, we have also embraced those people. In support. They don't have to really do bachelor's degrees, for example. To start with, they will have to do some of the, um, you know, certificate and diploma courses. The international student to get itself uh, the recogni recognition it deserves from the accreditation institutions uh, that we are... Mm. Sometimes governments find it difficult to collaborate with the International Open University because... They felt there should be some form of recognition. But if we are going to share anything in policy, the most important thing is that there is a way we can access. For example, at the moment, the university alone has a population of almost half a million okay. around the world. And uh, the and the cost that we are requiring for to run this university uh, is at a very minimal cost. It is a charitable university to start with. So cost, that means the students who are paying they are not paying more than a thousand dollars for their whole mm. program, meaning that to complete a whole bachelor's program, you are not paying more than a thousand dollars. So something that is very, very uh, cost effective for students. I mean, that is that is affordable rather for for children of of, of Africa. That is one. But there could, there should be subsidies mm. from government. There should be support from government. Government lawmakers must ensure that in order for university to succeed on state universities. They must encourage private universities to, to prosper. They must encourage private universities and support them, accompany them by giving them some form of support, financial, but also recognizing them so that they would be able to you know, accompany them. If there is issue of quality, accompany them, work with them so that the programs that are developed are also to the to relevant to the country in which the university is. is uh, uh. So I guess this is it. And we don't talk about it anymore. Uh, the African uh, Association of African Universities, if mm. I remember, launched uh, around 2013 the uh, Africa's uh, Center of Excellence uh, uh, project, which was funded sure. by the World Bank. That AAS project alone has been able to demonstrate, both for West Africa and Central Africa, we can professionalize universities. So we don't have to have professional universities in every country. We can have a professional university in West Africa in agriculture, one in, in uh, information mm. technology, another in, uh, in, in biochemistry, another one in health, etc. So that these universities would complement each other and be able to specialize in those areas, develop them, but spread their tentacles across the continent so that every continent, every country would have a kind of a hub or a campus of that same university. That way we reduce costs in the, in the education system but at the same time, we encourage uh, what we call um, that collaboration that Africa has always needed, that kind of a union of nations that would build the same um, citizens of Africa instead of being citizens mm. of Ghana or citizens right. of the Gambia. So you had really demonstrated Great. this. Yes, yeah, so before we let you go, finally, um, you and I know that 
um, in, in such a new paradigm, we need um, a lot of stakeholders. And you agree with me that education is a multi uh, a multi stakeholder um, element. It is not only based on one one person. Yeah. But one way that we've not been able to, mm -hmm. or we've not done better as academic um, institution, is the the gap between industry or the gap between society or community and that of for that of academia. You agree with me directly that if we want to achieve yeah. this, there is a need for us to bring industry and there is a role for them to play. How do we bridge that gap and how do we bring them on board to support this new um, strategy? Thank you, education in Africa. And I'm so successful education uh, from the post-primary, not even post-secondary, from the post-primary, mm. without critically looking at our education system in which it is all Absolutely. inclusive. When I say all equality, first of all, we need to take into consideration all the elements that would allow everybody to have to be a stakeholder, but not also that that education. That's to reflect in our policies. That is number one. Two, we have to realize that we need uh, mm -hmm. essential in our Africa's development today. In that paradigm we are also talking about, there must be some change, some focus in getting our own to, to build the kind of industries we need, but also linking that industry to our education mm. system. Let me just give you an example. After primary, the moment you have primary education, what we have always failed to realize is that there are some people Others who are endowed with good designs, with uh, creativity, mm. you know, uh, hands on creativity. So once you finish grade uh, primary six, normally, or grade uh, six, or whichever grade you are talking about before getting to secondary, uh, second, okay. that is where now there's a kind of an element of, uh, how do you call it, uh, um, uh, assessment that would allow to tap onto the probably more into the element of technical mm -hmm. only and the one who is more into the element of uh, let's say uh, academic. so the technical guy can now be rerouted into a secondary technical mm -hmm. institution that will allow the person now to be using more their intellects but the mm -hmm. hands on you know like in the area of technical design, we would create in the area of uh, mechanics we would create uh, an industrialist in the area of uh, mining which would create a miner something like that so what we call a hands-on education, mm -hmm. but within a context in which they would develop their skills, develop their potential without much, so that you create, you allow the private sector, it could be state industry, but ideally, uh, in Africa, it is good to have the private sector to, to and support them and allow now that education, that content of what they do, linked to the curriculum of the education system, so that by the time University, you can have universities that are probably state and others that are purely on academics, others that are purely on medicine, etc. So, as I said, once we rethink education today, we would probably be able to get that kind of a policy. I'm telling you this not because I'm, I'm it's wishful mm -hmm. thinking, because I've been the permanent secretary of the Minister of Higher Education in my country for years, and I've been able to develop that kind of policy that has, luckily for me, been approved and accepted in All parliament. Right. The implementation always okay. is a challenge, I agree, but I think we should be committed to do the implementation right. also. So, Dr. Barry, um, we are going to have a conference which we are looking at rethinking education in Africa, and I think these are very valid points um, that we need to put across. We'll be happy if you could put um, these thoughts on paper and share with us, and we will also invite you to that conference to throw more light on some of these um, useful and important points that you are sharing with us. But I think this is um, how far we will be able to engage you today on, on AU Talks because of time. But we'll come, we'll come back to you definitely, um, maybe in the, in the coming days. Thank you very much, Mr. Sam. I'll be much delighted mm. to share the, my modest contribution on this. And I'll assure you that uh, I'll be able to prepare something that I can All share right. with you too, so that we will get something uh, okay. ready. Uh, for the coming comp right. comp thank you very much for your time thank you very much so we have been speaking to dr barry and he is the vice chancellor of the european university 
or the International Open University of the Gambia. And he has been sharing with us his thoughts, his views, and what he thinks that um, we should be able to adopt in terms of policy as educators on the continent. How post-secondary education must be delivered in Africa. And this has been AU Talks. My name is Chrissy Sam. Thanks for watching. Yeah, hello. 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 The Association of African Universities, AAU, is an international non-governmental organization set up by universities in Africa to promote cooperation among themselves and the international academic community. Uh, my name is Professor Etienne Ewan Eile. I am the Secretary General of the Association of Universities African Universities, which is based in Accra, in Ghana. I will talk about the creation of the Association of Universities African Universities. You have to go back to the years 60 to be able to understand Le processus. Déjà en 1960, nos dirigeants estimaient que l'éducation est l'outil majeur pour pouvoir lutter contre la pauvreté et assurer le développement. I am not Dumo Lamini, I'm the director of ICT Services and Knowledge Management at the Association of African Universities. The Association of African Universities is a network of 400 universities in Africa. The biggest value that the universities benefit from being members of the association is this big platform that allows them to collaborate, allows them to work together, allows them to teach together. Through this platform, a university in North Africa can work with a university in Southern Africa, and also those in East Africa can work with those in West Africa. Founded November 1967 at a conference in Rabat, Morocco, by heads of African higher education institutions, the association is currently headquartered in Accra, Ghana. My name is Maxwell Amohoit. I'm the director of finance of the association of African universities. The association sustains itself from contributions from member universities and also from other development partners. Some of our development partners include the World Bank, other governmental agencies like the Swedish International Development Agency, UK Department for International uh, Development and other partners. We also receive a lot of support from other governments, especially the government of Ghana. Other partners include the African Union, which is more or less the parent organization of the Association of African Universities. The Association of African Universities hosts the Secretariat for the uh, African Union's Continental Education Strategy. And by so doing, we provide coordinating rules for the African Union in helping members achieve their targets. Déjà uh, 1960, Nos dirigeants estimaient que l'éducation est l'outil majeur pour pouvoir lutter contre la pauvreté et assurer le développement. Et rappelons-nous que les années 60, la décade 60, a été une décade où la plupart des pays africains ont obtenu leur indépendance ou ont, euh, disons, pris les dispositions pour être indépendants. C'était donc aussi l'année de développement, dans la mesure où tous ces pays indépendants devaient se retrouver de temps en temps pour parler de comment mettre ensemble leurs problèmes et trouver une solution commune à leurs problèmes. Et dans ce contexte-là, l'éducation était une priorité pour eux. Surtout l'éducation universitaire. 
Et sur ce plan-là, les universités aussi se sont organisées grâce à l'UNESCO qui a parrainé plusieurs réunions depuis euh, Madagascar jusqu'au Maroc. My name is Jonathan Umba. I'm the director of research and academic planning. The programs and projects that we run at AAU are consistent with our strategic plan and they are implemented for our higher education stakeholders, namely the higher uh, education institutions in Africa. These programs are implemented in such a way that our stakeholders will get the benefit of membership of our association. And our programs also are aligned with uh, a number of uh, global and uh, international agendas on higher education, including the Continental Education Strategy for Africa and the Agenda 2063. So these programs are aligned with uh, a number of uh, international agendas with a view to promoting higher education in Africa. The AAU is the apex organization and principal forum for consultation, exchange of information, and cooperation among universities in Africa. I am Professor Nkusa Mahao, Vice Chancellor of the National University of Lesotho in the Kingdom of Lesotho in Southern Africa. There are roughly uh, 77 universities that uh, are affiliated with the AAU uh, in the region. But as you might be aware, there are a lot more universities uh, that are as yet to take the membership of the Association of African Universities. Well, universities that are not members of the AAU are missing quite a lot. First of all, let's appreciate this one point that uh, the AAU is a main driver from the angle of training and capacitating the human resources of the continent. The agenda of the African Union 2063. So if a, an institution is not on board, it is missing the opportunity to leverage on uh, the uh, opportunities that are provided by the association in the area of uh, training uh, human resource capital, training their own staff and students, um, the opportunities that are provided by uh, the universalization of quality management uh, on higher education uh, on the continent, um, and many other opportunities that are provided. Et en 1963, il y a eu une réunion à Khartoum, au Soudan, où les chefs des institutions d'enseignement supérieur ont décidé de créer l'Association des universités africaines. Finalement, la création va se faire à une conférence qui s'est tenue à Rabat au Maroc et la création de l'Association des universités africaines a eu lieu le 12 novembre 1967. Je suis le prof Hassan Kafi, AAU Governing Board Member, représenté pour l'East African Region. Je suis le président de Plasma University. Mogadishu, Somalia. We really like to give a call for universities in in Africa, especially in East Africa, those which are not members still in the Association of uh, African Universities. Uh, be, we are calling them because we feel the organization is ours. It represents the voice of higher education in Africa being seen all over the world.
Good day, Africa. This is Events Update on AAU TV, the voice of higher education in Africa. Events Update is all about information on upcoming higher education events and scholarship opportunities in Africa. And it is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. My name is Isabella Teta Hinakwa. The Continental Education Strategy for Africa Higher Education Series is inviting proposals from African and diaspora academics, scholars, recent graduates and development practitioners for original essays to contribute to this volume on research and graduate studies in African higher education system. The topic should be one of these. Introduction, Research and Graduate Studies in Post-Pandemic Africa building research collaboration, cooperation and networking in Africa, future of research funding in Africa, governance and capacity building for graduate studies in African universities, research for ICT development in Africa, Africa's research needs and challenges of doing research in Africa and many more. The series seeks to systematically develop evidence-based information through a comprehensive framework of collaborative scholarly and professional participation with clear consequences for strategy, dialogue and actions from a continental viewpoint driven by the African Union's Agenda 23 Blueprint Compass. Proposals should include 200 words abstract focused on a chosen topic, a two-page outline of the chapter and description of what you will cover a recent CV that clearly indicates your country of origin and residence, and the list of your main publications. Interested authors are to submit their proposal before 20th April 2021, and for more information, email cesarresearchbook at gmail.com. La Continental Education Strategy for Africa Higher Education Series invite les propositions des universitaires africains et diasporiens, des universitaires, des diplômés récents et des participants du développement pour des saisies originaux afin de contribuer à ce volume sur la recherche et les études supérieures dans le système d'enseignement supérieur en Afrique. Le sujet devrait en être en introduction, recherche et études supérieures en Afrique post-pandémique, bâtir la collaboration, la coopération et la mise en réseau de la recherche en Afrique, l'avenir du financement de la recherche en Afrique et aussi le gouvernance et renforcement des capacités pour les études supérieures dans les universités africaines, recherche pour le développement des TIC en Afrique et aussi besoin de recherche en Afrique et défi de faire de la recherche en Afrique et bien d'autres. La série vise à développer systématiquement des informations factuelles à travers un cadre complet de participation universitaire et professionnelle collaborative avec des conséquences claires pour la stratégie, le dialogue et les actions d'un point de vue continental piloté par la boussole imprimée de l'agenda 2063 de l'Union africaine. Les propositions doivent inclure un résumé de 200 mots axés sur le sujet choisi, un aperçu de deux pages de chapitre et une description de ce que vous couvriez. Un CV récent qui indique clairement votre pays d'origine et de la résidence et répertoire vos publications principales. Les auteurs intéressés doivent soumettre leurs propositions avant le 20 avril 2021. Pour plus d'informations par email, envoyez à CESA researchbook@gmail.com. The Rotary Peace Fellowship is pleased to announce that application for the fully funded fellowship is open for dedicated leaders from around the world to study as one of their peace centers. The Rotary Peace Centers program strengthens the potential of peace and development professionals or practitioners 
through academic preparation, practice and global networking opportunities to become skilled and successful catalysts for peace. Interested candidates must be proficient in English, have a bachelor's degree, a strong commitment to cross-cultural understanding, potential for leadership and must have at least three years of full-time work experience in peace or development. Applicants are to submit their online application to the Rotary Foundation before 15th May 2021. Visit www.rotary.org for more information. Rotary Peace Fellowship est heureuse d'annoncer que la demande de bourse entièrement financée est ouverte aux dirigeants dévoués du monde entier pour étudier dans l'un de leurs centres de paix. Le programme des centres de paix rotatifs renforce le potentiel des professionnels ou des participants de la paix et du développement grâce à la préparation académique, à la pratique et aux opportunités de réseautage mondial pour devenir des catalyseurs qualifiés et efficaces pour la paix. Le candidat intéressé doit être compétent en anglais, avoir un baccalauréat, un engagement fort envers la compréhension interculturelle, un potentiel de leadership et doit avoir au moins trois ans d'expérience de travail à temps plein en paix ou en développement. Les candidats doivent soumettre leur candidature en ligne à la Fondation Rotative avant le 15 mai 2021. Visitez le www.retreat.org pour plus d'informations. Applications for the World Bank Robert McNamara Fellowship Program, RSMFP, is open to inspire development economics researchers from developing countries with World Bank research economists creating unique opportunities for the fellows to participate in rigorous policy relevant research. Applicants will have a unique opportunity to widen their perspective on potential development questions and how their research can address challenges in the developing countries. To be eligible, applicants must be nationals of World Bank WBG member countries, graduates of MA level studies, not more than 35 years of age, and must be available to relocate to Washington, D.C. for the duration of the fellowship. Interested applicants should submit a resume, statement of purpose in PDF file, contact of at least one academic reference and writing sample. This application is open till 30th April 2021. And for more information, email rsm underscore fellowships at worldbank.org. Les candidatures au programme de bourse Robert M.C. Namara de la Banque mondiale sont ouvertes pour inspirer les chercheurs en économie du développement des pays et développement les économistes de la recherche de la Banque mondiale, créant des opportunités uniques pour les boursiers de participer à des recherches rigoureuses pertinentes pour les politiques. Les candidats auront une occasion unique d'élargir leur point de vue sur les questions de développement potentiel et comment leurs recherches peuvent relever des défis dans le monde en développement. Pour être éligible, les candidats doivent être des ressortissants des pays membres du GBM, de la Banque mondiale, des diplômés des études du niveau MA, âgés de plus de 35 ans et doivent être disponibles pour déménager à Washington DC pendant la durée de la bourse. Les candidats intéressés doivent soumettre un curriculum vital, une déclaration de tension dans un fichier PDF, un contact avec au moins une référence académique et un échantillon écrit. L'application est ouverte jusqu'au 30 avril 2021 et pour plus d'informations, par email envoyé à rsm-fellowships.org. The World Conference on Research in Teaching and Education is calling for paper for the third World Conference on Research in Teaching and Education, which is scheduled from 23rd to 25th April 2021. This conference seeks to provide an international platform for the academicians, researchers, managers, industrial participants, and students to share their research findings with global experts. Interested authors are to submit their paper online via www.worldte.org slash online submission. 
And for more information, contact info at worldte.org or visit www.worldte.org. La Conférence mondiale sur la recherche dans l'enseignement et l'éducation appelle à un document pour la troisième conférence mondiale sur la recherche dans l'enseignement et l'éducation qui est prévue du 23 au 25 avril 2021. Cette conférence vise à fournir une plateforme internationale aux académiciens, chercheurs, gestionnaires, participants industriels et étudiants pour partager leurs recherches avec des experts mondiaux. Les auteurs intéressés doivent soumettre leur article en ligne via www.worldti.org bar online submission. Pour plus d'informations, contactez info.worldti.org ou visitez le www.worldti.org. Applications for the Mandela Rhodes Foundation, MRF Postgraduate Scholarship 2022, is open for young Africans to study in South Africa. The foundation offers young leaders from across the African continent a chance to become part of Nelson Mandela's legacy of transformative impact. It also provides a once-in-a-lifetime platform for professional advancement through a coveted postgraduate scholarship and leadership development initiative for those who wish to use their talents to help Africa. Interested scholars should be between the ages of 20 and 29, citizen of any African country and have a first degree with above average academic results. Applicants should apply online and upload needed documents, essays and recommendation letters before 20th April 2021. Visit www.mandelaroads.org for more information. Candidature à la Bourse d'études supérieures 2021 de la Fondation Mandela Rhodes pour les jeunes Africains à étudier en Afrique du Sud. La Fondation offre aux jeunes leaders de tout le continent africain une chance de faire partir de l'héritage d'impact transformateur de Nelson Mandela. Il fournit également une plateforme unique pour l'avancement professionnel grâce à une initiative convoitée de bourse d'études supérieures et de la développement du leadership pour ceux qui souhaitent utiliser leurs talents pour aider l'Afrique. Les universitaires intéressés devraient être âgés de 20 à 29 ans, citoyens de tous les pays africains et avoir un premier diplôme avec le résultat académique supérieur à la moyenne. Les candidats doivent postuler en ligne et télécharger les documents, essais et l'aide de recommandations nécessaires avant le 20 avril 2021. Visitez le www.mandelarose.org bar scholarships for plus d'informations. That is all for today's update. Event update is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. Please follow us on our social media platforms at Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, AAU TV underscore African Universities on Twitter, and AAU Official on Instagram. You can also visit our dedicated website at tv.aau.org for more of events update. My name is Isabella Tisahinakwa. Je suis Imelda Amoudi. The Association of African Universities, AAU, Africa's apex higher education organization, invites stakeholders to its 15th quadriennial general conference from 5th to the 8th of July 2021. The theme is the future of African higher education. The conference will be held virtually and hosted by the government of Ghana and the six sub-teams as follows. Sub-team 1, the future of African higher education post-COVID-19. Sub-team 2, contributions of African higher education institutions to addressing the challenges linked to the COVID-19 pandemic. Sub-team 3, contributions of African higher education institutions in achieving sustainable development goals. Sub-team 4, funding of African higher education institutions in the face of unpredictable economy. Sub-team 5, mainstreaming e-learning and the digital divide. 
Sabtim Six Contributions of the Diaspora to African Higher Education. Expert participants include ministries of higher education, academics, researchers and research organizations, regional economic communities, regional educational bodies like IUCEA, CAMIS, and Sarua, the organized private sector and captains of industry, development partners and other education stakeholders. The AAU's 15 Quadrennial General Conference is here. To register, kindly go to the link below and for further inquiries, please visit the website www.event.aau.org slash GenCon or send an email to secgen at aau.org and copy info at aau.org. AAU, the voice of higher education in Africa. L'Association des Universités Africaines, AUA, l'Organisation Fertière de l'Enseignement Supérieur en Afrique, Invite toutes les parties prenantes à sa 15e conférence générale quadrinale qui se tiendra du 5 au 8 juillet 2021. Le thème de cette conférence est l'avenir de l'enseignement supérieur africain. La conférence se tiendra victuellement et se sera accueillie par le gouvernement du Ghana. Elle comprend les six sous-thèmes principaux suivants. Sous-thème 1, l'avenir de l'enseignement supérieur africain après la COVID-19. Sous-thème 2, contribution des établissements d'enseignement supérieur africain pour le relever des défis liés à la pandémie COVID-19. Sous-thème 3, contribution des établissements d'enseignement supérieur africain à la réalisation des objectifs de développement durable. Sous-thème 4, Financement des établissements d'enseignement supérieur africain face à une économie imprévisible. Sous thème 5, intégration de l'apprentissage en ligne et de la facture numérique. Sous thème 6, contribution de la diaspora à l'enseignement supérieur africain. Les participants attendus comprenant entre autres les ministères de l'enseignement supérieur, des universitaires, les chercheurs et organismes de recherche en Afrique et au-delà, les organismes éducatifs régionaux comme la IUCEA, la CAMES, la SARWA, le secteur privé organisé et les chefs d'industrie, les partenaires de développement, agences et organisations internationales et d'autres acteurs de l'éducation. La 15e conférence générale quadrina de l'AUALA. Pour vous inscrire et participer, veuillez visiter la tinyurl.com bar AAUGC 2021. Et pour plus d'informations sur la conférence, veuillez visiter le site web event.aau.org bar GenCon ou envoyez un courriel à secgen.aau.org et copiez info.aau.org. L'AUA, la voie de l'enseignement supérieur en Afrique. Today, African, you're welcome to another edition of AgroLink on AAU TV. And AgroLink is a show that promotes agriculture and is educative as well as insightful. My name is Nana Ismamba Sam, and for this episode, we are here with the CEO of El Linear Farms, who is in the person of Mr. Ernest Oswansa. We are going to engage with him on the marketing and feeding aspect of pig production. Do stay with us as we bring you this insightful edition. Are you an institution or individual? Do you intend to organize a memorable event to be archived for future reference? Then look no further than AAU Studios because 
It's your best bet with our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4K Panasonic video cameras, KinoFlow lights, assorted microphones, live streaming equipment, among others, you are sure to get the best of productions. Visit us at Trinity Avenue, East Ligon, adjacent the National Accreditation Board, or contact the AAU studios via the following email addresses, info at aau.org, aautv at aau.org, or ransford at aau.org. Alternatively, you can call us on plus 233-244-736280. You're welcome back from the break. As I said before the break, we are engaging with the CEO on, ma on the marketing and feeding aspects of pig production. You can follow this discussion on our social media handles at the Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube and on our dedicated website at cv.aau.org. You're welcome to this episode. Thank you. Okay. So um, pig production wasn't really popular as it is now. Many people were, had a preconceived notion about it, negative preconceived notion about pigs, and as such, consumption and its rearing wasn't as popular. The sorted version is, or has always been popular, but the meat and it's still, it's still not really popular. How do you attract your customers and how do you sustain them? Because for now, there are so many pig farmers in Ghana. How do you sustain these customers? Well, um, as you just said, there are so many pig farmers yes. and also new people trying, trying to venture to into pig production. Yes. So we should tell you that um, pork meat has become very popular, popular. these days. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, it, it gives an advantage of added demand to, to, for, for pork meat, I should say. Um, with me, for example, um, when I first went into it, I was also wondering the same thing. But then, after I sustained my pig farm and increased the numbers, I realized that the demand kept increasing because, uh, for one, people who are trying to go into pig farming want pure breeds. Hmm. And there aren't too many places you can boast of that have pure breeds. They usually have mixed breeds or the local breeds. So a lot of people tend to come here to buy the piglets for their own pig farms. So that's one form of um, 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 marketing uh -huh. for that. Um, secondly, I also figured that, um, as I was saying before, if you go into the local markets, let's say Dome Market, Achimota Market, for example, um, I don't think you'd find any pork um, 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 vendors. Like when you go to the Abuchi and they sell their goat and cow meat, you can easily go and buy some. You're not going to find some of that there. So it's also an ad added advantage for people who produce pork meat uh -huh. to look into those areas. Um, the third aspect is also, um, I, I, I always believe in adding value to Your, whatever product yes. you That's are what into. sets you apart. So because of that, I decided to open some deli shops in certain areas in Accra and Tema. So that uh, people who want pork meat can, can easily, easily assess the exactly, meat. Very necessary. Exactly. At very competitive prices. Okay. And adding value makes it easier for people to deal with it. Instead exactly. Of, yes, that exactly. makes sense. So um, um, late last year, I also introduced um, pork sausage, mm -hmm. uh, minced pork. Um, I also do smoked pork, mm -hmm. spiced and smoked for your usual abeng kwain, katin kwain, that type of thing. Yeah. So... Do you salt I, pork as well? Yes, I do. Okay. And um, I've realized that people are now interested in the different variations of pork meat. Mm -hmm. So the demand has been increasing steadily and I believe in the next two, three years, pig production is going to be a major aspect of agriculture in Ghana. Okay. And um, just like the other forms of production, let's take poultry into consideration. Um, poultry farming was, or is still popular. However, many people rely more on the imported poultry because it's cheaper. People prefer buying that to going to the farms to get the actual poultry that we produce here, the ones that we know how they are produced. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's the same for pig farming as well? Well, um, with pig farming, I think the only part of the pig that is usually imported is the feet. Feet, yes. Uh -huh. It is the feet. 
And why why do you think the feet people prefer the imported feet to the ones that we have here? Yes, because um, um, the, the, wherever it is imported from, whether Europe, the Americas, wherever it is imported from, they have a lot of uses for the other parts of the animal, mm -hmm. but they have no uses Use for, for the feet. feet. So they believe Excess. that Africans love big feet, feet, so they should bring it here. Okay. So you think it's because, um, so you think when they bring the imported feet here, it's cheaper than the ones that we produce here. That is why people have a preference for the imported feet. Or uh, it's because of the taste? Um, I don't think so. I think um, it has a lot more to do with the taste. The taste. But preferably, I would prefer to salt my own pig Pork. feet. Yes. Um, apart from that, um, I don't see too much value in pig feet compared to Maybe the hind or the loin or the actual meat of the pig. So maybe we should look into um, brining mm -hmm. pork meat itself. Itself. If that's what people want. And that would add different variations to the different types of pork meat we have on the market. Take poultry farming into consideration. There are pig seasons, usually during the festive seasons. Is it the same for pig production? Well, I would say so. Because I'm um, usually during a festive seasons and uh, very important seasons on the calendar. People tend to consume more pork meat. So I, I, I would say that, but usually it's, a, it's an all year round activity. Hmm. Yeah, because basically, um, for example, it's just like fish. People eat fish every, every day. day. So people who love pork also eat pork whenever they want to. Okay. So um, it, it's up and down, but during, for example, like um, a good example is during Christmas last year, 2019, we made uh, a, 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 a lot of sales for, 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 for pigs during that time. Yeah. Okay. Um, and taking pricing as an option, do you think the pricing of pigs has reduced or the pricing has increased? Um, there are many people who are buying it now. Do you think the prices are going to affect how people demand, how much pork people demand? Or it's because people are more health conscious now, so no matter the price, you think people are going to consume more? Well, um, with, uh, with, with pork meat, there is a standard. Okay. Yes, for example, um, um, if it's a live weight, you know, we have what you call live weight and carcass weight. Okay. Um, during sale, for sales purposes. So live weight is when the animal is alive and somebody wants to purchase mm -hmm. a live animal. Because of the, you know, blood is heavy. So because of the blood in there, the price is usually cheaper. For example, maybe 10 CDs a kilo. But for carcass weight, after the animal has been slaughtered, it's 12 CDs a kilo. So people usually go by these standards to sell their pork meat. So how much do you, on the average, charge for your pigs? Well, um, for the piglets, it ranges from 250 to 350. Okay. And then... Uh, 5,000 Ghana cities. Um, basically, by the kilo, uh, we go by the standard of 12 cities on the farm. Mm. But after I slaughter and package and brand them mm -hmm. for my depot, it goes for 18 cities a kilo. Okay. And um, so is there a body that regulates the pricing of pigs? In the country? I'm um, not that I know of right mm -hmm. now in Ghana. No. I don't think we've got into that stage. That stage yet. Yes. Okay. So based on what you're saying, pig production is a very profitable, it's a very, very profitable venture. It, it is if properly managed. Properly yeah. managed. Okay. And I know that before you pack, you slaughter and package as well. Yeah. What are some of the sanitary conditions that you take into consideration when you're doing these activities to make sure that they are wholesome for consumption? Yeah. Um, I believe in quality, uh -huh. so um, I find it very offensive if meat is processed or packaged or slaughtered in undesirable environments. Uh -huh. So for that reason, I decided to build a butchery okay. here on the farm, well netted um, and tiled with um, um, availability of water. So that the slaughtering, cleaning, and packaging process is always done under very hygienic processes. Um, for example, 
the, one of the reasons why I decided to, because I could easily have gone to, like, let's say, a dummy market, mm -hmm. maybe lease the stall or something to sell my meat. But uh, if you go to normal, not all of them, but some Abochi people who sell meat in the market areas, you realize there's a lot of flies yes. and dust. So to prevent that and to give the customer the 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 the, 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 the what, what what I call special service. When you walk into my daily shop, even the air condition when you walk in there to buy meat is favorable to you and also it attracts new customers. There are people who eat pork but not on a regular basis. Uh -huh. But if they know there's an availability of pork meat somewhere, then they tend to buy it some more. So I believe in hygiene and proper animal keeping as well. Yeah. I know this might be out of your area, but then it's a usual practice or a common practice for people to slaughter animals when they are sick or about dying and then eating it as well. Because they think when it is cooked, properly cooked, then it is safe for consumption. How will I know that this pig or this pork that I'm about to consume is healthy and then the other one isn't? How do I differentiate between a healthy pork and a non-healthy? Well, it's almost impossible to determine after the animal has, has been slaughtered. yes but as i mentioned before that's why we have a slaughtering certificate if you want to slaughter an animal usually go through the environmental division at the assembly mm -hmm. or uh, the vet can give you such a certificate and what that certificate does is it guarantees the consumer that the animal wasn't sick before slaughtered mm -hmm. the animal is healthy and then the meat is good for consumption. So does that mean a vet comes to check every time you're about to slaughter? Yes. A vet comes or uh, somebody from the environmental department at the assembly comes. Okay. After the animal has been slaughtered, what are some of the transportation channels that you go to before it, is, it gets to the final consumer? Okay. Since um, I went into processing about eight months ago. Okay. Um, so far, so good, but one of the main challenges I'm having is transportation of the meat. Mm. So I'm planning to acquire a freezer truck, like kind of like the ones used by Farnais. Okay. So that if you have uh, meat depots that are uh, over long distances, you can easily transport the meat and they're still fresh. But for now, from where I am to Accra, it's very short. So mm -hmm. I have very huge ice chests. Okay. So after I package it, I put ice block on them and then I transport it. And besides, it's not very far, so usually the meat arrives fresh. Fresh. But mm -hmm. imagine you have to transport meat from here to, let's say, Kumasi. You are definitely going to need one of these freezer trucks to do that transportation. Okay. And um, you have a lot of pigs on your farm. How do you manage the waste from these pigs? Well, um, we manage them in two ways. Okay. And first of all, we produce a lot of manure from the pig waste because we also have vegetable farms we have uh, banana farms we have plantain farms we have corn farms and cassava farms okay so because i believe in organic we usually use a lot of this waste for them besides that to be able to keep the surrounding of the buildings hygienic we have built a biodigester mm. so that all the other waste that we don't need goes in there i was thinking about doing biogas but the waste from let's say pigs for example doesn't produce enough gas enough, yeah. like humans, humans waste to be able to provide biogas but that's in the consideration for the future okay so you run a mixed farming system yes to re reduce the number of okay and um i know there are lots of recycling that can happen from pig production do you have any of such recycled products or you just do away with the pigs well, and their um, heads and everything when they are done pig lard mm -hmm. the fat from pigs Very has okay. its advantages it can be used for so many things like like um cooking oil for example it can also be used to make different types of soup hmm. it can be it has it has a few other uses as well uh, but because my pigs, I breed them with no fat. I haven't gone into lard yet. But there are people, for example, when you go to Europe, people breed pigs for the lard. Just for the lard, not for meat. So that they can um, 
use their lad for whatever they want to use it for. Apart from that, there isn't that much waste from pig because, for example, in Ghana, every part of the animal is eating, mm -hmm. even to the feet. But when you go to, for example, um, I used to work on a farm in Canada years back, and for example, cow feet that they ship over here, they use it for rendering, which is they use it for leather and for other leather products. But in Ghana, I don't think we've gone into that stage yet. Even pig hairs, the hairs of the pig, mm -hmm, exactly. are used for, for to brush, and... brushes, stuff mm -hmm. like that. But I don't think we have developed pig production to that stage To that yet. extent. But hopefully in the future, we can consider that and go into that, yeah. Okay, so this is a good opportunity for someone who's thinking of a exactly. business idea. Exactly. Okay, all right. This is AgroLink and we've been discussing marketing and feeding of pig with the CEO of El Linea Farms Limited at Isuboy. We are going on a short break. When we return, we shall look into feeding and what it entails. Do stay tuned. This is Africa's most friendly nation, Ghana. A warm reception awaits you in an environment where you can discover and harness your full potential. Your home is an academic haven, lying northeast of the city center, a quick dash from the airport. A spirited community where young, vibrant minds are empowered to express themselves, break academic boundaries, and thrive in an atmosphere of rich cultural heritage and excellence in various collegiate and extracurricular activities. This institution represents a whole new world of fun and offers you a variety of activities, facilities and services geared towards your total development. Believing in the uniqueness of all our students, we encourage them to pursue excellence in integrity. Welcome to the University of Ghana, your preferred academic destination. You're welcome back from the break. If you just joined this discussion, you can go back to watch the previous on our social media handles at the Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube on our dedicated website, tv.aau.org. We are still here discussing marketing and feeding with the CEO of El Linea Farms Limited. So um, when it, you produce your own feeding on your yes, farm, yes, you, have your own sp you have your special components that you add yes. to it, which makes it more nutritious than what's on the market. Yes. Like, what's resulted in this initiative? Why do you decide to produce your own feed? Is, what's on, is the feed on the market not as good as what you produce here? Or you saw some slacks in what is on the market? Well, um, one thing I noticed when I first started was um, People sometimes prefer malt, so to get malt in Ghana, malt base uh -huh. in Ghana, you have to go to some place like Guinness or other places to get malt. And after considering the different, there are so many different feeding systems, okay. or formless, I should say, formula. And after considering a lot of them, I picked and chose a Different few components. things that I can put together okay. so that my animal has the best feed to be able to grow quicker. And basically I realized that there were four main ingredients needed in pig feeding. And you need some type of carbohydrate, one. Mm. So um, usually if you look at carb, you look at corn. So I grow my own corn. Mm. That's why I have Organic. My, corn, my corn farm, yes. Then it's very similar mm -hmm. to a human it's being. A human being yes. so, food digests more like how we digest food. So you need some type of, some type of fiber. And then um, there you go into something like rice bran or wheat bran. Then another component you need is protein. So people choose between soya and fish meal. I prefer fish meal. I don't, you can mix the two, it doesn't really change anything because um, fish meal is animal protein and soya is plant protein anyway. So if you mix the two, then you have the two combinations. Mm. And then the fourth important thing I realized is you need something that can help them digest quickly. You also need some type of uh, um, um, supplement that would help their feed digest quicker. Like, for example, toxic binder. And then there are also a lot of other supplements you add to the feed. 
so that when they eat the feed, it digests quickly and then they absorb the nutrients quickly. That enables the pigs to grow quicker. Okay. So still on feeding, how often do you think pigs must be fed in order for them to grow quickly? Well, people feed them sometimes twice, sometimes even three times. So if you give them the right amount of feed, and usually we give them the quantity based on the weight of the animal. Oh. So let's say a 100 kilo animal would consume about 5 or 6 kilos of feed per day. So with me here, I only feed them once a day. They eat in the morning and that's it to the next day. Okay. And so they are still okay. Okay, so you feed them based on rations. Exactly. Okay, um, so what of um, a pig that is pregnant? Well, with a pregnant pig, the best thing to do is to maybe increase the ration a little bit. Because, of course, you know, even with human beings, when you are pregnant, the ladies tend to eat more. <laughs> so, okay. if you increase the ration a bit, they tend to get enough for themselves and the babies. And comparing it to a human being, when a human is pregnant, it needs, or she, she needs more um, supplements and more nutri nutrients. Yeah. So, is it the same for your pigs? Do you it, change the feed when they are pregnant or you maintain it, but feed them um, more? Not necessarily. Um, sometimes... A pregnant soul may show signs of stress, lack of appetite, um, stuff like that. So with that, you treat them accordingly. Okay. But with the type of feed I have, even if she's pregnant, even if you can mm. just increase the ration a bit, I think they did okay. Yeah, I haven't had any problems with that yet. Okay, so if you realize your pigs are not eating that much, then you know there's something wrong. Yes, then that means they've lost appetite or they have worms. Oh. Okay, so that's when you do worm them exactly. in order for them to exactly. work it. And um, for someone who is about to go into pig production, how, how expensive are the feeds on the market? One main problem that pig farmers face in Ghana is because it's, um, the fact that most of the supplements that we put together to create the feed is imported. Like wheat bran is imported. Almost everything is imported. So in the future, I would hope mm. the government can actually look mm. at that. And, because I don't see why we can't create... Like, you know, we have a lot of rice farms in the north. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the rice husks, it's used to create bran. Wow. So why can't we produce our own bran? Because sometimes, if you go to the port, it's short because we don't have enough. This is another business idea for someone who's thinking of going into... Exactly. I know yes. a lot of people who have right now gone into pig feed production. Yeah. It's still a little bit expensive, but then they put everything together already. So you just buy it and then feed it to the animals. Okay. So I think we are getting Yeah, there. we are getting And you know, there are um, instances where the government steps in to put subsidies on feed for animals. It's the same for pork. I know um, when the government reduced the feed for um, live or for animals, the government left out fishes. Was pork included well, or was pig included in this well, initiative? Whether pigs, fishes, chickens, the mm -hmm. government is not doing enough. Okay. Because if you really want to support local agri farming in Ghana, there's so much more the government can do. You understand? For example, Farmers Day. Mm -hmm. If let's say I win an award for best livestock farmer and you give me a wheelbarrow, a spraying machine and cutlasses, what am I going to do with that? Do with that yeah. Why don't you give me pig feed? Maybe give me 100 bags of wheat bran or 10 bags of yeah. wheat bran. That would help me in whatever I am into. So I think some changes have to be done with that. Yeah. What are some of the innovations you've adopted? to ensure that um, you produce enough pigs on your farm and then to meet the demands that you have or you, to meet the demands during the pig seasons? What are some of the innovations you've come up with? Well, for one, um, when you're doing your structure, mm -hmm. you need to provide enough space and also create extra space for future For future, production. yes. That is something that a lot of people don't consider. They believe that if I'm going to be breeding Let's say if I'm going to start with three or four pigs, I build a sty that houses five or four. But forgetting that in four months' time, you are going to need to have extra structure. So what if it gets there and you don't have any money? So when you're doing it, you do it once okay. and for all. And then also you make sure that it's very airy. Because mm -hmm. pigs love air. 
if you make it too congested and non-airy, then you tend to breed diseases and other things. Um, to be able to increase your production is the feeding and the care. But feeding is most important because mm. um, the more they eat and how well they eat is how they grow. Yeah. And then also, if you feed them well, the females tend to be able to produce a lot of litter that are healthy. So that's, I think, one of the main things that okay. helps me improve upon my production. Yeah. Okay, so as an, or as an entrepreneur who is thinking of going into pig production, what are some of the challenges I should look out for in terms of feeding and marketing? Well, with marketing, I think we are improving on that in Ghana mm. because um, as we were talking about, people are now more interested in pork meat. Now, um, with feeding, mm -hmm. it depends on the type of formula yeah. yes. you adopt. Uh, I'm not saying if you adopt a formula of, let's say, um, um, cassava or something for your pigs is, is wrong. But then you also have to consider adding other supplements so that they have a balanced diet. Once they have a balanced diet, I don't think you have any problems. Um, also, um, as an entrepreneur, one advice I can give to upcoming pig farmers and those who are now trying to venture into the field, you need to be proactive yourself. Uh -huh. You can't go and build a structure somewhere and buy pigs and put them in there and forget about it and expect that someone is managing it for you. You need you to need be there. To be there. You need to be active. You understand? Yeah, because if not, if let's say, um, if I left this place to someone that I trusted, and the person had evil mind, mm -hmm. if the pigs have ten piglets, you can tell me they had five. How would I know? Yeah, okay. So you need to be proactive. That way, as an entrepreneur, you always assure yourself of moving forward. Okay. And lastly, you mentioned that the government is not doing enough in terms of all the agricultural production processes. Yes. So um, what, I'm giving you a chance to call on the government to, to, um, to address some of the issues that you have. This is a platform for you to get into contact with as many people as possible, NGOs, government authorities, higher education institutions. So this is your chance. Okay, one thing I can add to all that we've been seeing here today is for the government to be um, very adapt in the ways that they try to help farmers. It's not just saying, but there are a lot of farmers in Ghana who venture into all sorts of agri production activities. Um, one other thing I can tell you is, for example, if you look at the poultry sector, mm -hmm. about 90% of the poultry consumed in Ghana is imported. Exactly. Why should it be so? How hard is it for government to subsidize poultry farmers? How difficult would it be for government to subsidize pig farmers? Look at the situation of the rice farmers in the north. Mm -hmm. We still import millions of CDs of rice every year. I understand? If those millions are put into rice production in Ghana, and they shouldn't tell me about maybe the um, the rice produced in Ghana would not be able to sustain the whole Ghana. No. If the government was proactive right now, it would stop the importation or even just subsidize a small amount of rice importation and see how much the rice sector can grow up. Mm -hmm. Now, coming to my sector, which is pig production, for example, and you know Ghana is subcultural mm -hmm. and sub-religious. Yeah. So let's say, for example, Muslims would not have anything to say about pork because that's not their type of meat. But with others, um, I would encourage them to continue to eat pork meat. It's it is healthy. very healthy. Okay. It is white meat, not red meat. Uh -huh. You know you can get, you know what gout is? And gout is, um, it's a disease. It usually affects um, your toes, your feet. Even your knuckles, hmm. you know, and that comes from red meat, you know, and diseases 
I believe are transferred more quickly through red meat than red white meat. meat. Okay. That's why white meat is so healthy. Like rabbit, pork, even um, um, other types of meat are very healthy. So I encourage everybody to enjoy pork as much as they can. Okay, thank you very much. We had a very insightful discussion. This brings us to the end of this educative and insightful episode where we've been discussing marketing and feeding in terms of pork production with the CEO of El Linea Farms here in Esiboy. My name is Nana Ismobasam. <coughs> Do stay tuned on AAU TV for more educative content. I'm here with the Association of African Universities Television, AUTV. I just want to say that uh, without the media, you won't know what's going on in the world. Even with the media, you sometimes don't know what's going on in the world. So you need to tune in to the reliable sources who are really on the front lines, who can give you the information you need and give you facts, uh, not conjecture, give you real news, not fake news. And this is the place to find it, AUTV. The voice of higher education in Africa. and they want, they want collaboration, but you don't have anybody from outside your, outside your university. So that's why sometimes such gatherings are important. Um, allow me to begin. Uh, today we want to talk about curriculum design. Um, um, I know that some of us have introduced themselves as, as, as uh, uh, teachers, professional teachers. There are others who are from development and so on. But now we all teach at university, so I would like us all to look at ourselves as teachers. And from that uh, point of view, you'll allow me to use some nomenclature which is essentially uh, uh, professional for teachers, but it may sound new, but uh, don't worry about that because we are all in this together. So, so we all develop curricula in our various universities. We are all involved in developing it. Even if we don't develop it, we all uh, teach it. So in different places, people will use the word curriculum uh, differently. Um, um, a, a lesson plan in, in Britain will be taken to be a curriculum. But in this presentation, we use the term to refer to what is taught over a semester, over a year, in a certain discipline. Uh, what you teach through a degree program from first year to fourth year to fifth year, that is what we are use, uh, referring to as, as curriculum. So curriculum is any documented program of study. It must be planned. So it's a curriculum because it's a cause of study, it's a curriculum because it's planned. When it's not planned, then it will not be a curriculum. When it's not planned, it means you are telling stories, telling stories in class. So it is planned, it is well thought out, it is rationalized. That's what we use, what we, what we call a curriculum. Um, it's important to plan because you want to use the curriculum to achieve 
certain educational objectives. You want to use the curriculum to achieve certain social uh, goals. But the curriculum is bound by a physical, bound by a social uh, environment. So the curriculum is a document, but it is informed by the social, physical, and many times uh, political environment in which we, we, we are operating. Uh, so we shall say it is socially and historically located. Historical because what we, we, we learned in the 1960s is not what we are teaching now. What we learned those days is not what we are teaching now. The social environment changes from time to time. So it will determine what we, what we are teaching. It, te it determines what, what we teach. So the, the curriculum design then moving from curriculum. Curriculum design is an arrangement, is a structure that indicates the relationship between components of a curriculum. It's a design because you, you structure it in a way that helps you to achieve what you want. We are soon going to talk about the components of curriculum, but for now we are saying a, it's a design, curriculum design is the arrangement the way we organize those components of the curriculum. So Hilda Taba defined it in her way. Uh, 1976, Zeiss defined it in his way. The structure, the pattern, or organization of curriculum. But what they mean by curriculum is objectives, content, methods, and assessment techniques. So the arrangement of those four components is what you then call a uh, design. Uh, Onsen and Hankins, 1998, 2008, also think about it as an arrangement of the elements of the curriculum. The elements of the curriculum, objectives, content, methodology, and assessment. Design is the purposeful, systematic, organization of teaching points. Some people call them learning blocks within a lesson or a course or a program. You, you want to be very deliberate in the way in which you structure them. Um, you, want, you want to be scientific in the way you present your content. So you have a design that represents logic in the way you're going to teach. Uh, when we're designing curriculum, we're thinking about objectives, content, methods, and assessment. And we're saying you are required to align each of those components so that they complement one another. You want to align them, you want to structure them in such a way that they speak one to the other in a logical way. So, the basis for curriculum are external to the curriculum. They are issues that we, the planners, think about as we develop the curriculum. So we think about our philosophical position. What do we understand learning to be? As a person, there is a colleague who is going to talk about personal learning, personal teaching philosophies. So as a teacher, as a professor, what do you think, what do you take learning to be? So that will determine how you structure your curriculum. What about the people you are teaching? What do you understand about them? Do you even think that they are capable of learning, the, the people you are teaching? If you are teaching physics to girls, what is your attitude towards girls as learners of physics? Do you imagine that girls can learn and benefit from physics? That is an important question to you because you are planning to go and teach physics.
to girls. So what do you think about girls as learners of physics? There is a, an interesting, uh, there is a, a university in Kenya uh, which is for women and is for science and technology. All the students are women and the courses are science and technology. It is a private university and it has been struggling for 14 years. Uh, it has never closed. Struggling with students, enrollment, but they are struggling because the owners believe that they want to provide a place for women to study science. So for them, it is deliberate. They are not interested in money. They are not interested. They are struggling to get girls to do science and technology. So the people you teach, the people for whom you are preparing the curriculum, must feature in your thinking. Then, second question is, how do people learn? As you prepare your curriculum, you are thinking in terms of how do people learn? What do they learn? So do you believe, for example, that learners can generate their own knowledge? Learners can construct their own knowledge? Or do you believe that learners are tabula rasa and you have to bring knowledge and pour to them? And even when you pour to them, they cannot react in their own way. The Brazilian Paul Freire talked about the banking theory. So he compared teaching to somebody going to the bank to deposit money and at the end of the period can go and take the money back. Are you, do you think about your learners in that context?